Good morning. We're going to try and start on time at 8.30, so it's 8.25. Start taking your seats, and um, we're looking forward to getting this show on the road.
さん Well, good morning. It's 8.31. I did give a warning a few minutes ago, but now's the time to take your seats. Come on in. I think some of our colleagues out in the hall will come when they see you all sitting down and ready to go. So I'm going to start off. Good morning. And... Welcome to the 2018 Children and Youth Issues Briefing. We've got such a gorgeous day today, bright and sunny, and it's Valentine's Day where we can share the love for our children and youth. My name's Denise Mayotte, and I'm the Executive Director of the Sheltering Arms Foundation and the Chair of the Start Early Funders Coalition. I want to thank all of you here for joining us for our 14th annual Children and Youth Issues Briefing. This event is a gathering of people who are deeply invested in the health and well-being of our state's children and their futures. And it's so great to realize we've been doing this for 14 years and made such great progress. We're all here together. We're united in our focus for improving the lives and outcomes of our children in every community across Minnesota. During the past 14 years that we've hosted this great event, Minnesota has made tremendous progress investing in the needs of our children in ways that are profound and impactful and that are creating better outcomes for thousands of children and their families throughout the state. I want to thank all of you for your commitment and work in making this progress possible. And I know many of the people who are here in this room have been doing this for so very many years. Thank you so much. But as we all know, much more remains to be done. And as we approach this 2018 legislative session, this momentum must continue as legislators decide how to continue the great work to improve access to high quality childcare and education for all of Minnesota's children and eliminate opportunity gaps that so many of our youth face every day. Early childhood has been an area of broad partisan agreement. Legislative leaders of both parties and the governor deserve tremendous credit for their willingness to move this work forward on behalf of our children. Supporting our youth is a testament to the shared values we have as Minnesotans of taking care of each other and being responsive to the needs of our youngest learners. We know this work will continue until we reach that vision of a state where every child in Minnesota can succeed. And while we can be proud of the many advancements in our state, we also know that far too many of our children and families of color are facing unacceptable opportunity gaps. That is why we need to continue to make significant, and I mean significant, <laughs> investments that will have a profound impact on the lives of children throughout their life, starting off pre prenatally, going to home visiting, high quality early childhood care, education, after school programs, and innovative high school to career opportunities. I call on all of us to continue this important work and to keep the needs of all of our children and families on our minds as we head into this 2018 legislative session. In order to achieve success for all of Minnesota's children and youth, we must pursue equitable, and I underline that, public policies addressing the whole child with flexible solutions for all of the families in our state. From pre prenatal health care and education for mothers and families, to high quality early learning opportunities, all the way to engaging and empowering youth, it's our responsibility to ensure Min that Minnesota gives every child the opportunity to thrive. With important elections this year for all seats in the Minnesota House of Representatives and a new governor, it's never been more important to challenge and implore our state's leaders to make children and youth a top priority. 
Our children represent our state's potential and then there is no single investment that will have a more significant or profound impact on our state's workforce and economy. We must prioritize our children, close our unacceptable opportunity gap, and invest in our future. We're going to be hearing from several gubernatorial candidates later in the program, and I know you're all looking forward to that, and how they intend to lift up children and youth policies should they be elected as the state's next governor. I'd like to invite everyone to thank our generous event partners. This event is organized by the Start Early Funders Coalition, a statewide collaboration of, of over 20 foundations committed to ensuring that all children have access to high quality learning opportunities. And I'd particularly like to thank Kristen Rosenberger, our coordinator for her hard work in making this happen. And of course, Frank Forsberg for all of the work in putting this together. Additionally, I'd like to thank the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits and the Minnesota Council on Foundations, as well as say a very special thank you to our financial sponsors, which include the Greater Twin Cities United Way and the Sheltering Arms Foundation. And thank you, Sheltering Arms trustees who are here. <laughs> we appreciate um, your partnership to make today's event possible. We're also thrilled to welcome those participating via live cast across the state in greater Minnesota. And every year we get more and more people listening in um, on that live cast. So hello to you. And as always, for those of you on Twitter, I encourage you to tweet about today's event using hashtag CYIB18. That's the letters CYIB18. One eight, and uh, some years we've uh, we've trended with these, this event nationally. So let's try and do that again here. We got a really full agenda today, so we won't be taking any formal breaks. But please feel free to get up throughout the program as needed. You're all grown ups. Uh, the bathrooms are located outside the ballroom on the far end of the atrium, and coffee, tea, and water will be available throughout the morning. And you'll also notice that you have several handouts on your table. Please take a look at those and um, lots of useful and valuable information there. Now, um, please join me in welcoming our MC of the morning, Sandra Samuels. Sandra is the president and CEO of the Northside Achievement Zone. Along with parents, students, partners, and staff, Sandra is leading a revolutionary culture shift in North Minneapolis that's focused on ending multi-generational poverty through education and family stability. The NAS Collaborative is working towards a single goal, to prepare low-income North Minneapolis children to graduate from high school ready for college. NAS has scaled up to support over 1,000 parents and 2,300 students as they turn the social service model on its head and lead the creation of a college-bound culture throughout the community. So please welcome one of my personal sheroes, Sandra Samuels. <laughs> Thank you, Denise, or for many reasons. And I, I love funders, and so Denise and Sheltering Arms has been a, a partner with us for a long time. Uh, happy Valentine's Day, and I want to um, assure you that there is nothing more important that you could possibly doing, be doing with your life today than coming to a briefing about our children and youth. This is the future of not just our country, but this is the future of our world. And it starts here, it starts today. You know, well, it's been happening, but I mean, we continue it today. Because I tell you, I, how many of you lead nonprofits out there? All right, it's, um, it's, a, it's a hard world, isn't it? But I tell you, we cannot lead a nonprofit on the ground without legislators and without policymakers and without funders and families. I mean, we need each other, e pluribus unum. You know, out of many organizations, out of many walks of life and backgrounds, we have to do this together, one, one united front to be there for our children. And today, you know, of course we're going to be talking about equity, because that's what it's about. We need the work happening on the ground, and we need the right policies. In fact, we have a mantra at the Northside Achievement Zone. We are working so that systems do not hurt people. 
We are working so that systems do not hurt people. And you know, systems, the number one uh, characteristic of a person that gets hurt by a system is a low income child and children. And so when we talk about equity, I wanna just say a couple words about that. You know, the definition of it is really talking about the personal or, or social circumstances like gender, race, family background, that we make sure that they are not opt obstacles to achieving educational potential, human potential. And, and our children have limitless potential. If we would just get out of their way and that all individuals re reach at least a minimum basic standard, and, and we're not even talking about basic, because when you love up on your children, basic and minimum, that's out the door. That's like a starting place. We're talking about serving the full potential. And it is a struggle. There's a quote I love that says, providing every student, every child, every young person with a path to success, life success, academic success, requires a revolution in what we do. No, notice I didn't say a revolution in terms of fighting each other but a revolution in terms of what we do, that we have to do things differently and build different alliances. And you being here tells me that you're serious about this, am I right? And, and I'm, I'm gonna get ready, yeah, you're serious about this and we have to be, we have to be. Uh, I'm, I'm about to introduce um, our first speaker and I wanna close my part and, uh, uh, by just a couple words from Hamilton. I don't know how many of you have seen Hamilton. Uh, I haven't seen it, I saw it on YouTube. But, uh, but uh, there is a, a song called Theodosia, where Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr are singing to their children. And I love this song um, because they're talking about our young nation. Our nation was so young at that time. That's why we love Alexander Hamilton, the play. It looks at not just ideating a nation, but actually building it. And so in the song, he talks about how young our nation is, and it still is. You know, we're how many years old? 241 years. Can we compare that to Greece? Uh, 3200 BCE, I had to even look up what BCE meant. You know, basic common error or something like that. Uh, but anyway, the words are, you'll come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. And if we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you and you'll blow us all away. Someday, someday, you'll blow us all away. And I will tell you, that's why I do the work that I do, and I know it's why you do the work you do, So, because we know that when we do our part, our children will blow us all away. So with no further ado, I want to introduce a really important person. You know, I don't know if any of you noticed, but um, we got some funky stuff happening in our country these days, and uh, just a little bit. And, uh, you know, we have a new budget, we have a, a new tax bill, and of course the budget is a moral document and, uh, and speaks to um, us, our ability to lay a strong foundation for our children. And so I want to introduce to you Nan Madden. And Nan has been the director of the Minnesota Budget Project since 1999, like for 20 years, just about 20 years. And the Minnesota Budget Project is an initiative of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits that provides independent research, analysis, and advocacy on budget and tax issues, emphasizing their impact on low and moderate income persons and the organizations that serve them. Nan has authored numerous publications on fiscal issues as well as economic self-sufficiency. And it's really important to know that in 2006, she was named by Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal as one of the 40 under 40 honorees. Uh, and, and I tell you, I, I just met Nan, but from her background and the important work that she does, I do know your heart, Nan. And so thank you. Please come on up. Hello, good morning everyone. So I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk with you this morning about the policy and economic landscape that uh, sets the context for discussions about investing in our children and youth. Um, and there's a lot to talk about, so I'm just gonna jump right in. How many of you were here last year? Okay, and I gave you some really bad news. I told you about 
fundamental uh, changes that we potentially were facing on the federal level. Um, fortunately, I get to tell you that uh, most of those things have not happened yet. So um, often I am the wet blanket in the crowd. So I'm excited uh, to have some uh, good news to start with. But when we uh, convened last year, uh, looking, and we were looking ahead and wondering what 2017 was going to bring, uh, we saw that there were uh, federal policy and budget proposals uh, being put forward that would have fundamentally changed the way the federal government invests, the way it expands opportunity for children, youth, and their families, uh, and really could have changed uh, the trajectory, uh, especially for those who have the greatest barriers to economic opportunity. We saw a presidential budget and congressional budget resolutions passed in both uh, bodies of, in Congress that would cut trillions of dollars uh, from what's called the mandatory or entitlement portion of the budget. I do budget work, so I like graphs, so there's one. Um, so if you look at that part of the budget that includes uh, Medicare, Medicaid, other mandatory, trillions of dollars were uh, proposed to be cut out of that area of the budget. And for low-income families and kids, that meant threats to their access uh, to health care um, through basic uh, financial support, through things like the earned income tax credit, and uh, also um, nutrition assistance and housing assistance, cash assistance, all of those things at risk. These budget plans also called uh, for deep cuts in domestic discretionary. Oh, where did my pie go? Let me see if I can bring it back. There we go that dark green wedge called domestic discretionary. It's a very boring name, but that's the part of the budget that gets set uh, on a yearly basis through appropriations and includes everything from K-12 education, affordable housing, scientific research, community development, a whole range of federal funding streams that help us build stronger communities across the state. And that uh, set of cuts proposed there would be on top of the fact that there already are very strict funding caps uh, in place on that part of the budget. And finally, the third piece of these budget plans uh, would allow uh, large tax cuts to pass uh, through a fast track process. And it's only that tax piece that really uh, came into being in 2017, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. In addition to stepping back from a federal commitment to investing in opportunity, these proposals would have fundamentally changed the relationship between the federal government and states in providing those kinds of services, deeply cutting funding to the state while also shifting more responsibility for meeting people's needs onto the state and local governments. So as I said, the good news is that most of that did not happen in 2017. Uh, there was a considerable pushback in Minnesota and across the country, especially as bill after bill to uh, um, Roll back access to affordable health care was considered, and overall, instead, we saw a little bit different direction on appropriations. Um, the appropriations deal that was just recently passed, uh, recently reached, they they have not passed the bills yet that actually makes this funding uh, roll out, but um, they have to work through some of the details. But the deal uh, for appropriations for the fiscal uh, 2018 and 2019 years. Um, had some pretty positive steps in, in there for children and families. Some examples, along with previous uh, legislation, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, is now uh, authorized for funding for 10 years. Yeah, that's worth clapping for, for sure. That's a very important funding source uh, for health care for Minnesota kids and also pregnant women. The budget deal increases funding for the Child Care and Development Block Grant. Um, so hopefully that will open up some opportunities in the states uh, to uh, meet some of the new quality standards that the federal government has put in place, but also reach more families. And that deal also uh, included funding for our community health centers and uh, for home visiting, uh, which can really make a difference on getting kids off to a good start. Uh, that being said, uh, there still are some very serious uh, threats to our children and youth and their families. More than 6,000 Minnesota young people and their families remain in limbo because our federal policymakers have not yet uh, moved forward to continue DACA protections for young people who came to this country as children who've grown up here, who are really ready to make a, a big contribution 
uh, to our state and its economy, um, but we need the federal government to settle their uh, status. The budget that President Trump released Monday showed many of the same priorities as the one we saw in 2017, deeply harmful proposals that would increase poverty and inequality. Once again, it proposes to roll back uh, the historic progress in health care coverage, um, which would result in millions fewer having health insurance and gutting consumer protections. It proposes, once again, huge cuts in nutrition, housing, and other basic assistance for millions of, of Americans who are below or close to the poverty line. And if we think about who those are, um, it's primarily people who are working at low wages, people who are elderly or disabled, or are caring for young children. Some of the examples of what's in that budget, uh, what's called SNAP, used to be called food stamps, would be cut by 30% over 10 years. Families receiving rental assistance would see their rents jump, and the president's budget would fully repeal LIHEAP, which I think many of you know helps Minnesota families keep the heat on during the winter. Um, I don't think this is going to happen, but the president's budget suggests that we could just not do the, the additional funding that was included in the budget deal reached last week, including that additional money for child care. Now, the president's budget is just the starting point for the federal budget discussion. It's not going to be enacted in its entirety. But portions of that proposal or things similar to it will be um, considered, um, will get serious consideration in DC this year. So we need to uh, really be keeping our eyes out uh, for what's going on there. We'll see that some of those proposals move forward through legislation. But we've also seen an increasing use of administrative action uh, to implement some of the policy uh, priorities of, of the administration. And one recent example is that the administration now is approving uh, waivers for states to put additional barriers in front of low-income people uh, accessing health care. Um, to switch gears from budget to tax, so um, how the money is raised. So the federal tax bill is the big piece of legislation that did get passed in DC, uh, just barely in 2017. Um, and that bill does have some good things in it uh, for families and kids, at least in the short term. Um, but built within it is a threat, a future threat to funding many of these uh, services that invest in our children and young people. And that's because that is a tax bill that adds more than a trillion dollars onto the federal deficit, and that bill will be coming due. Um, and we've already seen proposals that say part of the way we're going to pay for that tax bill is by cutting back on the safety net. Um, but to start with the highlights, certainly the federal tax bill's expansion of the child tax credit uh, is a highlight. It increased that tax credit for families with children under age 17. Um, there are some important missed opportunities there um, that I think it's important for us not to forget about. There are substantial numbers of children, including 134,000 Minnesota children, who live in working families who will see a $75 or less increase in their child tax credit. Those are the families who struggle most to pay the bills. Uh, families with higher incomes may see $1,000 or more, uh, about $1,000 per child increase in their credit. So we lost the opportunity to be as targeted as we could have been with that expansion. And there's a million American children who lost their eligibility for the child tax credit because of their immigration status in the federal bill. Um, also, those tax credit expansions are temporary. All of the tax cut provisions for families and individuals expire in 2025. Um, some have said we don't need to worry about that, that a future Congress uh, will simply extend those tax cuts uh, for families and individuals. But if they do so, they're going to need to find the money to pay for that. And again, that presents another uh, pressure point on funding for investments in children and youth. Uh, the tax bill also uh, includes some pa uh, health care policy changes. Um, it repeals the individual mandate to purchase health insurance, which will have a kind of cascading effect expected to result in millions fewer Americans with health insurance and increased costs for those who buy their health insurance in the individual market. Um, and the final piece about the tax bill I just want to attach on uh, is um, the impact on nonprofits. Uh, so we've been hearing from a number of nonprofits, including those who serve children and youth, wondering what the impact might be of the changed uh, tax incentives for charitable giving that are included in that tax bill. 
Um, the main issue is that because of the way that many things are moving around in that federal tax bill, fewer people will itemize on their federal income tax returns, so fewer people will see a visible tax benefit from their charitable giving. The bill also uh, weakens the estate tax, so that's another hit on tax incentives for charitable giving. That really puts us in some uncharted territory. Um, I think the good news is that we know that Minnesotans are very generous. Minnesotans are, um, have deep connections to the nonprofits in, the, in their community that they support. Um, so we think that will continue. And also, uh, it's a good time to remind ourselves that Minnesota's income tax system does have a charitable contribution subtraction that provides a tax incentive for non-itemizers for their charitable giving. So that's something we've been talking about and, and raising up the awareness about. So um, that's what's going on at the federal level. A lot of stuff moving around. Uh, and that means our state level policymakers need to decide what to do in response, and particularly around this federal tax bill. Many states uh, use the federal income tax and corporate tax systems as the starting point for their state level taxes. So when changes are made at the federal level, our state policymakers need to decide to what degree we want to, um, what's called conform, adapt to those federal changes, or do we want to do something different? Um, that's going to be a very robust conversation in this legislative session and in the sessions to come. Um, back in November, I was kind of counting on maybe taking a little bit of a breather, not too much tax policy going on in the legislative session in 2018. Uh, that's definitely not going to be the case. Um, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of moving pieces in this tax bill. And I, it will be really important for our policymakers to take a look, understand the implications, and decide uh, what are the choices we need to make at the state level so we can continue to have the kind of tax system that we need, which in my mind is one that sustainably raises the revenues we need to make the investments we want to make as a state and one that, teach, that uh, treats our taxpayers fairly. Um, one thing that's really um, a little harder to get your head around about this, this tax bill is that for Minnesota to um, what we call conform to the federal tax changes, creates very different effects than what is the effect of the federal tax bill. So the tax bill, federal tax bill overall uh, was a tax cutting bill. If Minnesota just simply conforms to all the relevant parts of the federal tax bill at the state level, that would be a revenue increase at the state level on both income and corporate taxes and would uh, mean tax increases on some Minnesotans and tax cuts for others. So it's a, it's a complex uh, piece for policymakers to look at. Uh, they also need to uh, be looking at, and I think this will be a big point of conversation, is that the federal tax law changes makes the tax system less responsive to family size. It takes family size less into account. Um, and whether that's something that the state wants to replicate at, at our level or figure out ways that uh, we continue to be more responsive to, to family size is uh, going to be a big issue this year. Um, in addition, okay. What is going on with these slides? I'm sorry. They are, they have a mind of their own. Okay, I think that's where I'm at. Um, so in addition to tax, um, policymakers also will be thinking about the budget. Uh, you may know that Minnesota runs on a two-year budget cycle. They passed the budget last year, so we don't need to do a state budget this year. But there usually are discussions about what kind of changes we might want to make in addition to the, the major decisions made last year to fund our schools and affordable child care, child protection, all the various ways that state budget uh, impacts the lives of children and young people. We'll know a little more uh, later this month about what kind of budget landscape policymakers will be working in. Uh, you may know that the state kind of takes the temperature of measures the state's fiscal health twice a year in November and February. In November, the state was projecting some small uh, deficits. Uh, we do expect the picture in February to improve uh, because of things like the federal chip funding being passed. Uh, the tax bill is expected to have a moderate uh, economic impact that would boost state revenues. Um, but policymakers are going to be, need to be very careful about understanding to what degree um, any kind of revenue boost that we see in the forecast uh, is reliable. This is a time of really great uncertainty, um, and so we need to be careful about not committing to permanent changes that 
are um, predicated on the fact that we are showing revenues in the forecast that may be uh, one time or kind of more speculative. Some of the sources of uncertainty um, are in our economy. Um, you know, I think the recent up and down in the stock market reminds us that things just don't always move in a steady path. Um, but we're actually in a uh, almost unprecedentedly long economic recovery. Um, so we should expect that there'll be some economic bumps in the road, uh, in the road ahead. The impact of the federal tax bill, as I mentioned, is very complicated, and there's a lot of uncertainty about how businesses and people are going to respond, what kind of behavior changes. Um, a fast-moving uh, piece of legislation may have some mistakes and loophole opportunities in it, um, and so I think uh, we need to be careful about that. And then, as I said, um, last year and this year, some pretty profound proposals being put on the table to cut back on federal funding to the state. So really planning for an uncertain future needs to be a top priority uh, for our policymakers uh, in this session ahead. Certainly there are many critical decisions ahead at the state and federal levels, um, but that's why I think I'm really excited to see all of you here. Your voices in this discussion are so important um, so that policymakers are always have it in front of them that investing in our children and youth needs to be a top priority because we know that when we build a bright future for our children and youth, we're building a bright future for us all. Thank you. Nan, it's so wonderful. I feel so secure, even though we're in uncertain times of having a woman like you um, who are helping guide us you know, uh, in, in the considerations that we have. You know, Winston Churchill said that history was just one damn thing after another. And, um, and every time I hear about budgets and so on, it's like, there we go again. And so the, while there are a lot of threats, there are a couple of things that you said, Nan, that stood, up, stood out for me. Um, we do have some threats, 6,000 families uh, in limbo, and a lot of uh, threats to, um, to the safety net basically, and, uh, and that the landscape is uncertain. And, and the thing about it is what's clear is it's um, policymakers are going to have to plan for uncertainty, but as you pointed out, so are we nonprofits, um, and so are our families and our children, and, uh, and we walk hand in hand with them to do that. And so, Nan, you know, thank you so much. And again, we've been down this road before. And, uh, and I, I am heartened that we're in it together, and I know we can do this. So next, I want to go ahead and introduce um, Diana Anderson. I want to say a little bit about uh, Diana uh, before I start in the organization uh, that she's with. But Diana has spent 16 years with the Southwest Initiative Foundation and even more in southwestern Minnesota. Uh, she co she's constantly struck by how deeply people care for each other in their communities. I, f I feel the same way, Diana. We can get cynical sometimes. As president and CEO of the Southwest Initiative Foundation, she sees how the organization has balanced an enduring mission with being nimble enough to respond to the, uh, to the region's changing needs. And I, and I, and I think the, the mission is extremely heartening. Their mission is connecting people investing in ideas, and building communities. Uh, today, Southwest Minnesota has a need that is too big to ignore. Too many kids aren't getting the best start in life, and Southwest Initiative Foundation is working to change that. They have been recognized for their leadership in building a strong cradle-to-career approach to closing the opportunity gap in greater Minnesota. And I would add, extremely innovative um, from, from what I've, I've seen. And this morning, she'll share where Southwest, Southwest Initiative Foundation and its partners are headed together. Diana. Well, good morning. I am delighted to be with you here today to share a bit about youth issues and innovative solutions in our corner of greater Minnesota. 
Uh, the Southwest Initiative Foundation is a regional community foundation encompassing the 18 counties of Southwest Minnesota. We're headquartered in Hutchinson, and we're one of the six Minnesota Initiative Foundations. Together, we've been working in our rural communities across the state for 32 years. And we share some similar programming, such as our early childhood initiatives, and also have focus areas specific to uh, the unique needs of our individual rural regions. Two years ago, after decades of working to identify and address a wide range of economic and social issues, our Southwest Initiative Foundation Board of Directors made the strategic decision to shift from seizing countless opportunities that require time and resources to focusing our efforts in a way that will deliver the greatest impact for the future of our region. And I believe we have a slide to go with that. forward button? There. Um, so over the next 10 years, Southwest Initiative Foundation will position itself to become the regional champion and inclusive partner to close the opportunity gap so that every child in our region, from cradle can, to career, can reach his or her full potential. Um, during this time frame, Southwest Minnesota will continue experiencing a shift in demographics. A 2017 University of Minnesota study um, on immigrants and Minnesota's workforce points that our state's population will grow older and more racially diverse. We are seeing this in our region. 20% of our population is over the age of 65. And in the next 25 years, we are projected to grow from our current 276,000 to 316,000 people. Uh, and in all but thir in 13 of our 18 counties, 100% of that population growth will come from people of color. Uh, new immigrants are already making a significant contribution in our region. Without these new families, many communities would be feeling the impact of outmigration. Instead, school populations are stabilizing in communities like Wilmer, Worthington, Marshall, Glencoe, uh, and Walnut Grove. Main streets are being revitalized, jobs are being filled, and new businesses are sprouting up. Our rural communities benefit from an entrepreneurial spirit, rich cultural tradition, and strong work ethic of our newest residents. We're not without our challenges, I believe we're headed in the right direction. Still, as I travel the region, I hear stories of entrepreneurs not expanding their businesses because they can't find enough skilled workers, parents forced to make hard decisions because they can't find quality childcare, and immigrant families struggling to fully participate in their new communities because of language and cultural barriers. The vitality of our region and the strength of our rural economy depends on everyone being able to participate, and it starts before birth. We need to ensure all Southwest Minnesota kids of all races and in all communities get the best possible start to life. We're calling this work Grow Our Own. The numbers tell a compelling story. 11,000 children, nearly one in six, live in poverty in our corner of the state. Nearly half of those children are under the age of five. Forty percent of families in southwest Minnesota are classified as low income, compared with 33.6 percent for the state as a whole. In his book, Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis, Robert Putnam notes that children from low-income families are more likely to lack access to mentoring and role models, quality education, enrichment activities, and the social capital that opens doors and minimizes the damage of poor decisions. As communities become more isolated along socioeconomic lines, there is a lack of empathy that fosters negative perceptions of poverty. Our region is working from a position of strength. We have great schools, higher than average graduation rates, low crime rates, healthier babies, and more children screened before age five. 
We also benefit from a strong spirit of collaboration and high rates of volunteerism. And our smaller population means that even small investments can make a significant impact. The Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire is partnering with community foundations across the country to understand what the opportunity gap looks like at the local level. Last February, they prepared a brief for Southwest Minnesota that is guiding our efforts. Well, it affirmed what we already knew, like a growing number of children living in poverty and changing demographics in many of our communities, it also provided us with valuable insight. Specifically, the percent of new immigrants in our region not speaking English is higher than the state average, as is the number of youth that are reporting that a parent has or is incarcerated. To help deploy our resources in the most effective way, we've adopted a framework put forward by a group of nonpartisan thinkers and practitioners through the Suaro Seminar at the Harvard Kennedy School. It focuses on five areas, stable families, quality early childhood education, engaging K-12 experiences both in and out of school, safe and caring communities, and career on-ramps for success. Both the Carsey Brief and the full Suaro Report are available on our website. We're seeing incredible examples of how individuals and groups are having an impact in these areas too. I'd like to welcome one of our great partners, Patrick Walsh, to the stage. Patrick has been high school principal at ISD 423 in Hutchinson since 2011 and over the past five years has led a collaborative effort to build career academies that integrate career pathways and hands-on learning into all curricular areas. Patrick? Here we go. Okay. So, Patrick, you were part of an early regional conversation about the movement to incorporate career pathways into high school curriculum. Um, tell us about that journey and where ISD 423 is today. Well, initially we had uh, um, many schools, many people in the, in the southwest uh, area who were getting together to discuss, like, how do we improve connections? How do we um, increase opportunities for students? And having been in education for 30 years, um, I hearken back to uh, Lou Holtz quote, when all is said and done, more is said than done. And, uh, um, and I feel that really depicts a lot of our actions in education, is that, uh, and we saw that through our initial efforts um, with that, is that uh, we met a lot and we talked about platitudes, but we really didn't get anything done. Um, so. Uh, one of the things, though, that emerged at that point was that um, we really needed to uh, figure out a direction. I think people were kind of actually discouraged. And I remember uh, one of the members of uh, SWIFT coming to me and saying, you know, how can you spread, you know, these ideas, your ideas to other schools? And I said, I, I don't think I have time for that. I just need to be able to do it at our level. Great. Um one of the things that I have been really struck about uh, with the Tiger Path uh, Academies is the community engagement and collaboration. So um, tell us what that looks like and why it's so important to the success of this paradigm shift at the Hutchinson Schools. Well, number one, it creates communication channels across the community. I mean, everybody, it's really getting to the point where everybody's talking about Tiger Path. And uh, teachers, our teachers are actually kind of skeptical, I would say, is that until they started hearing it from the community and parents, it was like, oh, I, this, this actually makes a difference. And uh, seeing articles in the paper, so it, it, it's kind of correcting ourselves to make sure that we're talking about things that really matter. Um, you know, kids' futures matter. I think teachers in general want to make, make that type of difference. But until we had a common um, I would say theme of discussion, there really 
wasn't anything to talk about. You know, uh, we spend hours analyzing, you know, our shooting guard, you know, how well they go to their left or to their right. Uh, we don't spend hardly any time talking about people's education. So what's different with Tiger Path? Um, Tiger Path is different because our eighth graders, as an example, um, my son is an eighth grader. Um, I've got a grandchild that's in kindergarten too, but um, I, have a, I have a son who's an eighth grader, and uh, so uh, we play uh, basketball games and stuff like that. It is, it is very, very common for people to ask me questions about Tiger Path. It's very common for kids to come up to Mr. Walsh and say, hey, Mr. Walsh, uh, should I do this or should I do that? Um, I assume that uh, others in our educational system are having that same type of deal. So all of our eighth graders have a four-year plan. Um, they've never set foot in our building. Um, two years ago, I had a eighth grade daughter, and I said at the time, I also have a twelfth grade daughter, but I said, my eighth grade daughter knows more about the high school than a kid graduating from, from our high school. Uh, because we start our connection with um, our students in eighth grade, in December of eighth grade. By now, I have all their registration. They know about every class that we have in high school. They've had multiple 15, 16 conversations with our counselors. We start, we start looking at a student um, in the eighth grade as our student. We know the seniors are kind of checking out from us. They don't want to talk to us at all. So um, we said, they're gone. They're, they've got one foot in college, but we need to get that one foot into the high school. So that's a big change. You know, coming from a smaller um, school background, um, one of the incredible important things for me early at Hutchinson was that how do we recreate this small school feel in Hutchinson? Because we didn't know our students. They passed through, and, and we weren't asking questions. So number one, um, kids know about it. Number two, when you get to Hutchinson High School, you're gonna have a strong um, set of electives early on in your career. Um, what I discovered, you know, it took me a long time, 15 years probably as a principal, where I'm going, you know, we have these great ideas for courses, but kids don't have access to them. Uh, they start off and we're full of requirements. Um, we have you know, all of the, you know, four, 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 three, and then you got foreign language and all of these things. The only kids that were getting electives were the kids that didn't choose to do the fun things like band and choir and foreign language. And we would dump those kids into that, those areas. And so nobody was really doing anything foundational from, from a skills perspective. So we've kind of upended that. We've said, you know, we're gonna have to have early opportunities to get deeply into skills-oriented things. Um, in 2015-16, no, 2016-17, we had over 100 kids in Welding 1. You know, we have only 225 kids in a grade, so I want you to consider that in English 9, which is our maximal impact, is 225. So we had over 100 kids in Welding 1, we had over 100 kids in Woodworking 1, and we had over 100 kids in drafting one. This year, we have over 100 kids in first aid. So we're trying to basically tip the schools upside down and say, let's give the kids electives early so they kind of have some idea as to why they would dig deeply into a given area. Great. So um, it, it's a holistic approach uh, across the curriculum, but can you talk a little bit about the career and tech technical education piece, because that's really innovative, uh, what's happening in Hutchinson right now? Well, I would say it's implicit in our mission. You know, our, our entire high school is about career and technical education, you know. So um, as far as the, the investment in the, from the community, uh, another dialogue piece is that we are talking the same language um, to the extent that our, our community felt action um, in uh, investing $1.4 million into our career and technical education area. Um, you know, Tiger Path means different things to different people. To the people in our STREAM Academy, which is, uh, you know, science, technology, renewable energy, um, and um, engineering, architecture, art, um, all kinds, of automotive, transportation, manufacturing, all of those things. Um, 
you know, for those people, it means machines. It's about skills. It's about workforce issues. You know, um, this is across our entire building, so it, it, it includes things like um, health care. You know, it includes things like human services. Um, one of the interesting uh, byproducts of this whole discussion was as we were trying to create welders, we started looking at ourselves and saying, you know what, we have a teaching shortage and we're doing nothing to replenish that supply. So one of those things was just to simply uh, uh, get people to understand that we need to talk to our own students about also being teachers. Um, so it's, it's, it's across the board, you know, and uh, we have a monopoly on our students and we did nothing to, uh, you know, to increase our teaching supply. Uh, that came to me uh, one day when I went up to these two senior girls in the hallway and I said, hey, uh, what are you guys going to, where are you going to school? Well, we're going to Southwest State and Marshall. Uh, what are you going for? Well, we're playing volleyball, but we want to be teachers. And I'm like, wow, you know, they've been here for four years and I had no idea that they were even going into teaching. You know, we have a monopoly on these students and we're not even doing anything to replenish that supply. So... Across the board, um, we are expecting our entire community um, to, you know, fulfill its mission to say we want to maintain our vitality economically, uh, skills-wise. Um, with that, um, we have 40% of our workforce in Hutchinson is manufacturing. We also know that a large percentage of success that we will have will be in people returning to the city of Hutchinson. You know, are we likely to attract somebody from Springfield, Missouri? Well, maybe maybe not, or Springfield, any state. Um, it's gonna be, uh, you know, Springfield is a very popular name, you know, so, uh, um, so knowing that our most likely people to return are people that grew up in this area makes sense that we should really, really focus on trying to um, equip them with the skills necessary to be successful in our entire uh, local domain. Grow our own, yeah. Um, when we first sat down to plan for this conversation, I had in mind that it would focus on the on-ramps for success pillar of our framework specific to career and technical education. But as we talked about it, it was clear to me that Tiger Path impacts um, multiple facets of a student's life, um, including families, including the K-12 engagement outside of school, including safe and caring communities. Um, can you talk about your vision for um, moving high school out into the community? Well, one of the, I think you go to the components of Tiger Path for us is that one is early access to skills-based education. Um, you know, that, that came about uh, through looking for these welding candidates. You know, we have this huge need for welders in uh, the city of Hutchinson. And as I went out to the University of Minnesota and River Falls and all these ag programs, I said, do you have anybody in that school that can weld? Because Ridgewater had a shortage for at the college level. And basically blank, yeah, we don't have anybody. And so it's like, who is, who's doing this stuff anymore? How are we gonna educate kids with, with this high need that we have? And eventually I got to St. Cloud State and they said, well, we do have this one junior. And uh, you know, and I said, what's, you know, could you give him my number? Well, he's going to Elk River, he's gonna be a student teacher in Elk River. And I said, tell him he's coming to Hutch. And uh, so um, he did call me three days later and I said, I'll tell you what, Justin, if you come to Hutchinson, we will give you a job when you're done student teaching. I had no idea how I'd do that. But he is currently teaching at Hutchinson right now, and he is one of our primary um, welding people. So I want to I want to say that part of part of this is that you you need to take a different mindset when it comes to um, I'd say an entrepreneurship is that you need to have that facility to be able to move in different directions in education to address that. Now I've lost the question, I'm sorry. Uh, pl Plugamans, that's such a great story, but uh, <laughs> Plugamans from, uh, he's Southwest Minnesota, he's actually from Dawson Boyd, and I'm, uh, and uh, so it's like, great he story. needs to be here. Another grow our own, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, well, I just, uh, again, 
you know, we, we have these pillars that we talk about um, that really uh, impact a child's life from cradle to career. And they're not discrete. Uh, you don't look at them one at a time. They're very interconnected. And that's what really struck me about um, the philosophy of education that comes out of the Tiger Path program is that it's not just focusing on the career uh, piece of it, it's really looking at the entire student um, and their uh, connection into the community, uh, their, uh, you know, the needs of the family, uh, and how you build relationships with those students. Well, when you think about high schools, um, high schools get, you know, basically we have a bad reputation is that we are, we are distant, you know, we're very, uh, you know, very uh, um, academically oriented, and they are, uh, you know, Elementary teachers go to go to edu into education because they love students. High school teachers generally go into it because they love the subject. Okay. And uh, so I think it's changing that discourse and saying, you know, that we need to ask people what it is that they need. I think it's servant leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, is that uh, servant? You know, the servant mentality to uh, your students is that I am not here so you so I can get you to do what I need you to do. You know, I am here to do what you need me to do, and I'm going to try to educate you as to what it is that uh, is is out there. But you need to get me to be an action for you, and that's how we try to upend our school too. Um, it's totally about you. It's not about me. Um, I don't need you to fulfill these types of units. So with that, is that we need to look at very closely at our curriculum and saying. What is, what is important to our students? A recent very um, high yield um, proposition is that we started looking at you know, our curriculum. We have, we have a number of kids that fail certain courses and I've always been looking at this as a high school principal. Is like, why is it so many people fail that? And then you find that low reading skills are, are an impairment. You know? So what do you do to get them through these requirements that you know, the state has put forth and you get ridiculed, you know, because you might have lowered standards and things like that. Well, you know, you're making it too easy for kids. You know, I'm like, well, man, it looks tough. You know, from my perspective, it looks really tough for that kid to get through it. You know, their, their parents do this. You know, they, they, they don't read really well. They're not very interested. You know, they got a drug problem. And then we're going to ask them to uh, get through this, you know, manage through this, you know, forest of things. So, you know, one of the... the things that we looked at was that our ninth grade science curriculum is, is really tough. I mean, you go, you walk into our ninth grade science classes, Hutchinson High School is a very good school. I mean, it's amazing. We have very good teachers. But you walk into that ninth grade science class, and I feel like I'm at NDSU again. I'm like, wow, that is really challenging stuff. I don't even remem remember that, you know? I know I have a Gadros, but I don't know the rest of it, you know? So um, we made this option available next year with the endorsement of, and, and this is like the third thing in the science area that our teachers have actually endorsed, which is a critical um, barrier, I think, to change, is that you gotta get people to understand why we're, we're going to make changes that may affect their department and may affect people. Um, but uh, we started a class for next year called PS Engineering. En PS Engineering is an option that kids can meet the standards. If you look at the ninth grade standards in, in uh, science, there's a lot of chemistry, a lot of earth science, there's a lot of physics, and there's also this engineering standard. Well, the engineering standard really doesn't get covered real well. There's not hardly any school in, in Minnesota that does really well with it. So we said, because our barrier was that you know, well, what about the chemistry standards? What about the physics standards? And I said, well, what about the engineering standards? And it was like, you know, it was a call to action. So I asked the, uh, these two 20-ish science teachers, I said, if you had a three-year-old boy or a 13-year-old boy, which I have, they, have, they both have three-year-old boys, and uh, I said, do you think that automation is important to the future of a kid that's growing up in Hutchinson, which is 40% in the manufacturing sector. Well, clearly I knew the answer to that, is that you, you can't look at the employment sector in Hutchinson and know that automation is not part of our future. So we started this PS Engineering, which is robotics, um, automation, engineering, and 
on a whim. And uh, right now, we have over 100 kids who have opted for this PS Engineering um, course as a freshman. What that does, now we've also drawn um, partnerships with 3M because of these things. Um, what that's done is that we are also opening this up, because it's a required thing, we are opening these things up to girls, um, engineering and automation as a female occupation, because we certainly need that. Um, and, and we're giving kids a choice. You know, for, for the most part, we haven't really given kids a whole lot of choice in the types of things that they can pursue. Thanks, Patrick. Well, we're uh, running short on time, but want to close uh, just with um, uh, lifting up a couple of the challenges that um, as uh, policymakers and uh, state leaders are gathering to have um, the, the legislative session, what are some of the issues that um, need to be addressed from a policy perspective? I know we've talked about the teacher pipeline and uh, some about academic standards. Well, some things, obviously we have a teacher shortage. That's a, that's a huge issue. Um, so I, I really think you have to take every opportunity to recruit and give people opportunities to do internships um, in education. Um, from a policy perspective, I think one of the, one of the major things that we're looking at, um, I'm not, it's 122, Minnesota statute 122A30. Um, I would reference that is that for, for high schools in particular, that gives us the opportunity to hire uh, people up to 0 .80 um, in areas of, of diminished uh, teaching supply. Um, I think we're going to be using that in the future. I think flexibility and standards and credits and those types of things are, are essential for us to, um, to move on. As an example, right now I have two teachers in vocational areas that are, have retired for next year. Um, I've been advertising for two weeks and I have one candidate and that candidate is probably not hireable. Um, so, you know, right now I'm looking at local um, options to educate our students using 122A30. Thanks, Patrick. And with that, we're going to wrap it up and uh, turn it back to uh, the program. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Diana and Patrick, thank you so much. That was um, absolutely riveting. And it, and it has everything to do with two things. Um, Diana, the plan of the foundation, the 10-year plan to close the opportunity gap. And I, and I just want everybody to notice that she didn't say achievement gap. She said opportunity gap. And that, and that is, so you guys are like on it. <laughs> you know, so often achievement gap suggests that brown, low income kids, um, that they are not achieving and not that we, the adults, are not providing them the opportunities they need uh, and to serve their highest potential. So I just want to thank you that it's 10 years and that you know the, the whole Grow Your Own that both of you are talking about in partnership is amazing. And Patrick, you are, you know, I would be in your school any day. Um, you know that quote you had, when all is said is done, uh, more is said than done, that is not the case with you. Um, and the whole tiger path, and it, and it just makes sense to me that you would say, what is in our community? What are the jobs here? And how do we prepare our children for them here? And of course, some will leave. But just growing your own and making sure that their education is relevant, that is, it seems so simple. <laughs> and, uh, but it's not. So I just want to thank you so much for that. Well, right now, I want to go ahead and introduce um, someone who is amazing. She is a principal at the Secondary School for uh, Creative Arts. And, uh, but I tell you, um, one of the most important things besides that is that uh, Dr. Hines uh, is also my soror. So, ooh, she's a Delta Sigma Theta. And uh, <laughs> I know some other ones in the house, so. Um, but, you know, I tell you, one of the things before uh, Dr. Hines comes up, um, you know, she has a career that spans two decades, and she has experience as a middle and high school teacher, professional development co coach, a dean of students, a principal, a senior director of educational effectiveness, and she just really walks her talk. You know, she started at the University of Minnesota and got a degree in agricultural business management. 
And then she, uh, when she was done, she said, I don't think so. And, uh, and then she went on and, uh, and got a degree in um, business. I actually have it here. I was trying to remember it, so sorry, sis. Um, but she got a second degree, a master's in business education, right? And then traveled around Mississippi, Tennessee. But, so this is the reason I brought up Delta Sigma Theta. But as she was doing all these things, one of the things that got her back to the, um, the, the business and doing business education was that while she was a sorority, um, she was doing public service and working with high school students and just fell in love with them and fell in love with educating them and showing them possibilities and using her life. And, uh, and then she went back and, and moved back here and got her doctorate degree. And we are so happy that she decided to do that. And I just want to, um, you know, our children can smell adults that don't really care about them. They can. They smell us when we're coming in the door and when we're not being real with them and authentic and really asking to hear their voice. And you're going to hear about this amazing school. I mean, it is beautiful and it is amazing. But I just want to, in, in introducing Dr. Hines, Sister Doctor, I want to just give you one quote she made uh, some time ago. And she said, I want to give students the encouragement that they don't have to let their current situation determine their destiny. I want to be known as the educator that provided students with a new lens, the lens of opportunity. I want students to be able to view opportunities and doors that they thought were closed to, to them. Uh, Dr. Hines, thank you so much. Good morning. Well, that was kind of humbling. Um, again, happy Valentine's Day. My name is Dr. Hines, and I am the, I'm the humbled principal of Creative Arts Secondary School, which is a part of St. Paul Public Schools. We are a part of the K-12 Arts Pathway with St. Paul Public Schools, where we serve grades 6 through 8. Where's, can you advance the slides? The next one. So as you um, preview our mission and vision, I'll just give you a brief overview of what our school is made of. So we have 38% of our students are African-American, 21% are Asian-American, 17% are Hispanic-American, 22% are Caucasian, and 2% are Native. 82% of our students receive free or reduced lunch, 16% are qualified for special ed, and 20% are ELL learners. So we are a very diverse building. But we are very intentional about what we do. We have, if you can go to the next slide, um, we service both performing and visual arts, including media arts. And it is intentional that we create a learning environment where students use their artistic voice to change the narrative, our, narrative of our society. And I would like for you to invite you to visit our website so that you can learn more about us. We are located at www.spps.org backslash creative arts. And now at this time, I am more than happy to introduce to you my administrative intern, Lee Vang. Lee Vang is responsible for making connections with our families and also um, providing leadership opportunities for our students. So Ms. Vang. All right, good morning. Um, as Dr. Hines said, my name is Lee Vang. I'm the admin intern and family liaison here at Creative Arts School. Um, I probably should also say I'm a St. Paul Public Schools graduate, resident. Uh, <laughs> I'm also a parent. I have a fifth grader at Phelan Lake, and um, I've worked for St. Paul for 16 years. I was a middle school teacher, um, three years as a personalized learning specialist, and then now I'm at Creative Arts, so I've pretty much had a good time in St. Paul thus far. Um, I am also very humbled to work with our student and staff equity teams. Um, my work with them has really been just about listening um, and trying to perfect my expertise as a professional troublemaker to ensure that our students can leave our schools with their souls intact. Um, so when this opportunity ar uh, arose for us, um, you know, the adults discussed it. I said, I'm just gonna ask the kids. <laughs> Let me just go ask if they wanna do it. And um, it's been very 
honoring to work with our students who have spent additional hours outside of school, uh, over the weekends, on Facebook Messenger, on Snapchat, and everywhere else discussing this. Um, they wanted to make sure you all knew this was a collaborative piece. We brought together our student equity team, our Gender Sexuality GSA Alliance, and our student council. So you have representatives from all three groups here. They wrote this under the um, advisement of our GSA advisor and English teacher, Jess Weller, and our literacy coach, Mr. Shane O'Reilly. Then they've practiced this and performing it with our theater teacher, Rachel Brady, and our arts program manager, Ben Lacina. They also wanted to make sure um, that we honor the absent narratives that are not on stage. Um, we have 400 other students with beautiful, complex, talented identities back at school. Not all of them could be on this stage, especially because you all can see the size. Um, but they wanted to ensure that where we spoke and where they spoke was from their personal and local immediate, so we would not speak for others who are not here. Um, so that being said, Please let me introduce you all to our students. We have Alicia, who is a senior. We have Chang, who is in 10th grade, a sophomore. Jayla is our only middle school student. Kurt is in 11th grade. Michaela is in 11th grade. Nguyen is a 9th grader. Wawa is a 9th grader. And Yang is a 10th grader. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, is there anyone who wants to share about the weekend? I don't want to be here. Hey, did you study for the test? Huh? Did you study Pass. for the test? Class, class, yeah. focus. Yeah. Class. All right, so as of last week, I mentioned we'll be learning about exploration. Is there anyone who wants to summarize what we read over the weekend for homework? <laughs> yes, Michaela? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, I didn't see myself in it, and I saw my people viewed a certain way, so I learned that this textbook needs to be tweaked. All right. Um, Ching, why don't you summarize what we read over the weekend? OK, so the reading was about how Columbus came to the Caribbean Sea. He brought diseases, captured native and as slaves. Then he sent a letter to the queen about his experiences. Thank you. <laughs> he is always a goody goody. A goody two shoes. Because he's Asian. Oh, come on, Chang's just smart. <clears throat> Anyways, back to learning. Wait, if slavery never happened, would white supremacy still exist today? Can we just go back to our agenda class? Ooh, it would probably exist in a different form. But what kind of form? Can we just go back to our agenda class? No, we need to talk about all this injusticeness. You mean injustice? Ooh, can I teach the class? How about another time? If you aren't happy with the way things are being taught in class, you can talk to the admins about the injustice. No, you're gonna sit down and let us teach you about all of our issues. I am the teacher here, okay? See, this is what I mean. Just because I'm younger does not mean I don't know anything. So why don't you listen to what we have to say? Hear it from our perspective. All right then, all right, just let me teach for 20 minutes. The last 10 minutes of class, we can talk about issues. How does that sound? Whatever. Yeah. All right then. So, as I mentioned, we'll be learning about the uh, Atlantic slave trade that's happening. Sorry, I'm late. It's they all right. They changed my schedule. Here, 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 here you go. Don't forget about that. Wait, Nina, why did they change your schedule? Yeah, it's literally the last period of school. All right, um, 10 minutes left. This is where I'm willing to hear about your issues. Who wants to start? I have issues. All right, then. Begin, please. You see, I always try to fit in with people. I always try to meet people's expectations. But is that me being myself? What's harder is when teacher, parents, and all the close to you don't even support you in what you're doing. I always wanted to be a dancer, yet my parents told me no. They told me to be a doctor, because we're Asian, and that's the best way to make money. 
But later on, if I'm struggling in life, they will blame me for not trying to make their dream come true. And I will blame myself for not trying to make myself happy but others. I always wanted to be a dancer. You know what just happened before I even entered the class? What happened? They changed my schedule. They put me into a lower class because they think it was the best thing for me. And now I don't even have dance class. They make me realize that they will support me, but they will put my dream and career to be a dancer aside because it's not important, guys, because it's not important yet. Now I don't even have the opportunity that I need today. So when you guys are saying you're supporting me, you're doing what's the best for me, are you really, though? Thanks, Nina, for being honest with us. Um, uh, Alicia, do you have anything on your mind? As humans, we have this complex mind system. We are capable of so much, yet what school and society is teaching us is so simple. We're constantly learning about the black and the white, the right and the wrong. We're learning about being singular. Most of us aren't just singular. We're not just one race, one culture, or one identity. What about those in the gray area, those in between? I am a senior, I graduate this year, and I'm still trying to figure out my place in this world, but it's hard when half of you is being disregarded by my peers and society and education. I am not seen for who I fully am. I am seen as a white girl. I am a white and Hispanic girl. All I want is for my history to be told and for me to be whole. Alicia, anything on your mind? No. All right, then. Uh, Ching, what about you? Oh, yeah. I feel like I need to say this. All right, then. OK. So I'm just here to do my homework, and we have an assignment due tomorrow. I mean, who cares what adults do? <laughs> just focus on what's better for you. Are you serious? Boy, did you just say that? Did you just say that? Why? I understand that you want to come to school and just learn and take notes. But obviously what you said, like, trigger folks. So hearing our perspectives lets you know why we are the way we are. And can I hear yours? Well, I work hard, and I don't focus on Actually, negative stuff. Can, just, can I share? Go ahead, please, Jane. <sighs> OK. Um, people see me as the perfect student, the stereotypical Asian kid who knows the answers to everything. I was born in a refugee camp in Thailand. My family moved here for a better future. But when I got here, I started going to school and I realized how I was being treated like, like a freak, a refugee. I was ashamed of my culture and who I was and the language I speak. They made me think the color of my skin was what, I was, what all I was worth. When will this end? The stigmatism against people born from a different country. Instead of putting us in a box, listen to what we have to say and listen to our voices and stop Americanizing us. It's sad, but hey, he's happy, so he's probably happy. The smart Asian refugee. Thank you for uh, being honest. Just be yourself, Ching. Um, King, do you have anything you want to share? Any thoughts? Stop labeling me. Stop assuming I'm a loud, uneducated, violent black woman because of the way I look. Don't assume I'm ghetto because my hair is styled differently than yours. Stop assuming I'm this or that because you can't see past the stereotypes. Stop blaming me because your eyes can't, and mine can't see past the stereotypes that are based off the system of racism and oppression. If I choose to speak my mind, I'm not angry. If I don't listen to rap music, I'm not black. If I'm articulate, don't be surprised. I'm more than just a stereotype. I'm more than just your stereotypical black woman. King, do you have anything you want to share? No. I'm All right, good. then. Um, anyone else who wants to share that point of view? Oh my god. I wish I was able to speak out like that. I mean, come on. I'm the only one here who's disabled, and that's hard to come by. Even if I am just some kid who shouldn't be using a cane. They don't even know how hard it is for me to get out of bed on those days. 
Yes, I'm 17, but my joints pop and creak like an old house. My hips tilt like trees in the wind. My spine is bent and twisted like a river, and my immune system attacks itself like I'm the disease. I get it. I'm young, and I shouldn't be using a cane. I understand. I'm a teenager, and I shouldn't have to go through that. But is that really what I need from you, though? No matter how many times it's blown off is probably just growing pain, or maybe you're just sore, I need you to believe my pain and believe my needs, even if I am just some kid using a cane. Kurt, do you have anything you want to share with the class? Huh? Oh, uh, no. All right, then. Uh, Michaela, I see your hand is raised. Do you want to share anything? Yeah. Um, I know your history, the ups and the downs. The doors to my school are the entryway for America's roller coaster. And I'm told to go on this ride that only goes now. And yet all I see are the pitfalls of my people's history. I mean, we all know roller coaster doesn't only go down. That'll be weird. But the ride, the ride attendants are programmed to say, and then I've been on this ride for far too long. A Lori Joe song, every day we fight the system just to make our way. We've been down for too long, but that's all right. We were built to be strong because it's our life. Every day we fight the system. Never like the system. We've been down for too long. I wish I can tell my whole story, but as of now, I'm going to do what Kendrick Lamar said, to stand up for something. So I got off the roller coaster, and I learned so much from doing so, like about microaggressions and how colorism isn't just black and white. I learned about anti-blackness, eugenics, white supremacy, the list goes on. But how will we know better if this system continues to run on this plain, broken system? And the ignorance of the ride left us in an awkward place where people are afraid. They start to stumble and stutter when it comes to talk about injustice and race. Our society is changing in so many ways, but we're stuck on the systemic ride. Oppression and injustice still affects us in so many ways, but we wouldn't even know because it exists in so many different forms. Macklemore rapped, dang. There's a lot of opinions, a lot of confusion, a lot of resentment. Some of us scared. Some of us defensive, and most of us aren't even paying attention. Seems like we're more concerned with being called racist. All right, that's the double pass. Um, how about we talk more about this tomorrow? Okay, no? Uh, chapter 15 notes are due. Um, whatever. Whatever. whatever you say. Is this a movie? Yeah, a movie. The Black Panther. If I was an adult, I will put everything down and be present so that I can actually listen by calming my mind, opening my heart, and by clearing my spirit. If I was an adult, I would stay by their side, never leave them, support them, and take care of them, and create a strong bond with them, and get to know them on a personal level. If I was you, I would listen right now and see and take the time to understand their perspectives. Is your best really the best for me? I need you to see the whole me. Teach me when I don't know what I don't know. Americanizing immigrants and refugees is promoting self-hate. I am more than just a stereotype. We may be young, but we have old problems. Please get off the ride and disrupt the system. All right, everybody, let's give them one more round, one more round.
I just want to let you all know that you absolutely slayed that, okay? You slayed it. It was so good. When uh, Frank and I got to go over to um, the Creative Arts School and, uh, and hear them, the thing, and when they were just practicing and you memorized, I mean, it was just so good. Um, I told them that day, like, I'm telling you, I'm not just an adult who's sitting here who needs to affirm the youth. You really are good. And so thank you so much for that. So, you know, I, I have a couple questions for you, but could we start out by you introducing yourself? Just give us your name and what grade you're in. Okay. I'm Alicia and I'm a 12th grader. Chang Vang, I'm a sophomore. My name is Michaela Kamara, I'm an 11th. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Okay, first question. Um, tell me something that um, gives you energy. Like, right, just like one thing that really gives you energy, that energizes you. And then what are you dreaming about in terms of your future? So you can answer both of those at the same time. Okay. <laughs> um, something that energizes me is music, obviously. I don't know if that was obvious enough. But um, music, and I honestly don't know what to do, but I'm thinking about joining, like, going into the social justice field. Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You, de you definitely have the, the, you can articulate the length, you know, the, the, the real issues, and you did that powerfully in your piece. And when you say music, you sing, or you, do you sing? Uh, I'm getting into singing, but I play okay. several instruments. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Um, writing and uh, being with the people who I want to be with, because they inspire me to do a lot of stuff. Uh, my future dream is uh, to be happy, live a life with no regrets, and be true to myself. Yeah. yeah. Woo, woo, woo. So let me ask you a question about the writing. What kind of writing do you like to do? Poetry or? Uh, I do poetry, rap, and I write songs and short stories. Okay. Do you want to bust a little rhyme for us or? Um. <laughs> He's really good. Are you really good? Like a little tiny one, tiny, tiny? I mean, hold I'm on. Putting you, I'm totally putting you on your spot. You think about it. Think about right, it. All right, I'll and about I'll come it. back. I, right. And, I, and I, I'll, I'll bust a rhyme too if you do. All right, cool. All right, yeah, all right, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> um, something that gives me energy is writing also, and same being with friends or people who are uh, positive in my life. In my future, I want to be a child therapist using animals, so kids who are like disabled using animals as a therapy. Wow. How did, yeah, that's great. How did you come to that? Um, I, my whole life has struggled with anxiety and other, you know, like, things, and in freshman year, everything was really bad, and I got a pet hedgehog, and oh. I am, he's Milo, he's my little baby, and... Like you got a real one? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he's fat. Um, God bless your parents. <laughs> and I just noticed, like... When I had something I was able to go to when I was depressed or having an anxiety mm. attack, that he wow. would just calm me down. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, that's amazing. All right, so um, the, the, pe the play you did today was incredibly powerful. And, um, and, I, and I think Kurt said, um, we may be young, but basically what we're saying is old, right? It's not new. And, um, and you did history class. I hated history when I was in school, and, uh, and it had a lot to do with a lot of the themes that you all talked about today. But tell me, you know, how you, and if you'd like to recite some parts of your piece, if you feel like, you, you know, you can, for us, just to kind of, any poignant piece of your reflection, and then tell me how you came up with it. Okay. <laughs> so you both just looked at me like Michaela. But, um, so my piece, I was listening to music as I did mine, and that's where like Lori Joe, she's a songwriter, Kendrick Lamar, he is a rapper, and then the last piece, um, Macklemore. Um, so Lori Joe and Kendrick Lamar, those came from the same song called High Power, and then Macklemore's piece came from a song that he, a rap that he wrote called White Privilege. So that's basically like where I took like those bits and parts of it, and I put it in, and I put my perspective, and I used the um, metaphor of a roller coaster because I like using a lot of metaphors and whatnot. But I used the metaphor of a roller coaster because that's just how I feel like I'm riding through school. So. Okay. Yeah. So the music inspired you and resonated with what you feel like you experienced. Yeah. All right. Is there any part you uh, could recite for us? Uh, could you do the ro roller coaster piece? The roller coaster? 
Huh? Did you know the piece of your piece that where you did the roller coaster? I'm putting y'all so on the spot. <laughs> um, and if you even have it written, that's okay. You know the roller coaster. When you talked about the roller coaster, I was like so moved by that. So from can the, you do a little piece of that? The top. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I know your history, the ups and the downs. The doors to my high school are the entryway for America's roller coaster, and I'm told to go on this ride that only goes down. And yet all I see are the pitfalls of my people's history. I mean, we all know a roller coaster doesn't only go down. That would be weird, but... Uh, no, that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. good right there. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's good. Because that was... I, I am 52. And so 40 something years ago, that's exactly how I felt. That's why I hated history. Cause I felt like it was all about how people who looked like me went down. I never heard the up, but I didn't have the language. That's what's so powerful for me is that you actually have the language to articulate that. Um, so thank you. All right, who's next? All right, I guess I'm next. Okay. So um, being a writer, it was very difficult to write without no inspiration. So after talking to Ms. Vane and uh, a close friend of mine, I got inspiration about point of view, perspectives. And my part was as a teacher to see if I was a student and if I were to, hold up. If, at the end, if I, was a te if I was a student, what would I have done if I was an adult? Because at the end, I mentioned if I was an adult, I will listen right now and understand their perspectives. Thank you. And, and, and by the way, I, don't, I, I just want to stress something you said at the end yes. when, he, when you talked about being present. And uh, did everybody get that? And he said, you know, put, put the stuff down and like listen to me. I know I struggle with that with uh, my teenagers and I'm just like busy and I'm like faking, I'm listening and I'm not. And you know it, don't you? Yeah, we, we know it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you for that wisdom. Um, so my part was kind of inspired by my whole high school experience because um, I went to an elementary school and we never really talked about race, middle school never really talked about it. And then I came to Creative Arts and I noticed everyone was really open about it but for a long time, I never knew, based from my history class, that I, like, I always knew I had Hispanic, but I never embraced it because I, quote unquote, didn't fit the standards of being a Hispanic. And so I really wanted to write my piece because this year I joined student equity team after talking with Ms. Bang. Um, and so this was just kind of showing the thoughts that people who are like me who don't want to be very expressive, who are kind of scared to, but then kind of coming to terms with yourself that you, that this is who I am and it doesn't matter what anyone says, so, yeah. That's pretty powerful. And, uh, and, and what, what led you to want to join the equity team? Um, so, <laughs> Ms. Bang doesn't know this, I kind of wanted to join last year, but um, this year I just, felt that there needed to be just, I wanted to be able to have more of a voice with Hispanic and white God. and just kind of let people know that I'm not scared anymore of who I am. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. <laughs> I know you all, when we were talking the other day and you brought it up today quite a bit, is just, um, as young people, you're embracing your intersectionality. That, and, and I know that came up in the play too, that you're not this one thing, right? And there are many aspects of who you are and it's like, see me, see me. And uh, so thank you, it's really, a, you know you're really leading us because we really don't get it right, you know? And, uh, and still are afraid to own, you know, who we are. So, um, so one last question, and I'm still, you know, like if you want to bust a rhyme, you, you I know. I got you, I got okay, you. Okay, okay, <laughs> we're, we're gonna close with that one. But, um, so you know that there's a saying that um, kids don't drop, young people don't drop out of school, they're expected out, right? So there are so many things that we adults do um, that lead someone to say, I'm done with learning, I'm done with that path, I'm out. Right, and I'm, I don't know if you've known anybody who dropped out of school, anybody who struggles and you know, really just 
hates it, you're not sure if they're gonna make it. Anybody who's like, their just lives are really challenged. Um, my question for you, especially when it comes to the school, um, how do we make school a place that's relevant for people? Like if you could tell us one thing, like what do we do as adults? Yeah, I can go first. I went first the other times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not, I keep looking over I, I, there, Michaela. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. Right. Um, so I guess a little bit more freedom, openness, because at Creative Arts, the art allows us to connect, mm -hmm. be free, and express who we are and be more open. And I noticed that, it, it, I felt it when I walked into the building, right? Just kind of, it was just the vibe. I wanted to make something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else? I guess I'm going. Um, I think more, I know that there's the standards that there has to be for a school, but then maybe once you cover that, ask more what we want to learn and kind of get our thoughts on what it is mm -hmm. and also just like what he said, give us a way to like express that because it we're probably most likely possibly won't verbalize it. We want to show it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what they said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, also just like the way that you're teaching, try to probably switch it up. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe diversify like. Mm -hmm the perspectives on things, because mm -hmm. students learn differently. I know I learn differently when it's said by different people, and I learn it differently when it's said from different perspectives. So just trying to get that um, into the schools. So, yeah. All right, thank you, thank you. Really, thank you, that is amazing. Um, so do you want to close us out with, um, yes. with Buster? I mean, I don't know, it's kind of long, but is that okay? Yeah, yeah, we got it, okay. All right, cool. Yes, we're good. All right, so um, this was my ever first performance I've ever done. This is my first spoken word that I've ever wrote. So here we go. <clears throat> In life, we fight for what is right. So why do we do the wrong things when we know it's not fine? Why do we beat brothers and sisters for being family over stupid stuff like technology? No, it's not that. It's because of anger. That is why we're not afraid to put bullets in each other. You see my father, he told me that the world was right. So I went out, but never spied the light. So scared of the dark, I closed my eyes every single night, struck by fear, so I hold what I held there tight. Just now noticing that you were never really there by my side. So I cried, but I couldn't, because I'm a man. That's what we were taught, right? So I wandered this world by using my sight, still surviving through that hardship and pain with my own might. Now, now we aren't perfect, but we can be better. This is why I'm writing this letter. Fathers and mothers working hard, just trying to make our lives greater. So why do we fight each other, not hold hands together, be there for one another, never forget that we are strong and that love can last forever. You see, I never really understood the world. That's why I found my own morals. Society decides what is normal. So when you talk to an outer, please be a little bit more formal because respect isn't given, it is earned. The moment we were born, we were given a race, but not who we are, but the colors of our face and that we're this sex on the outside, not asking what gender this person identifies as in the inside. Now, now we aren't perfect and we make mistakes, but we learn and in return, knowledge is earned. Thank you. You're right. Hold you're right. On. You're right. I, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. We were told you were gonna go. Ah! I was like, maybe they forgot that part. No, no, okay. No. This is Sandra D. Once Ooh. again Ooh. to okay. represent my PD friends Ooh. to rock you on like I said I would mm. to rock you like a PD should. Well, I'ma get on the mic and turn it out. So when I'm through MC and they'll be okay. That's it. I'm done. Fire. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was like amazing. You made my job like totally easy. And I can't believe you remember that whole rap. That's amazing. <laughs> so everybody, you know, thank you. Thank you. This is like what we get when we actually uh, listen to student voice. And student voice is so, so important in terms of us knowing what to do. They are absolutely, you know, you heard that saying, a child shall lead you. Uh, the youth, we have to be open to that. And I know sometimes I just so don't get it. 
Um, but these students at the Creative uh, School are just amazing young people, and I just want to thank you. You, you. All of you are just brilliant, and you are blowing us all away. You are blowing us all away. All right, well, right now, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Nancy Jost. And Nancy is the Director of Early Learning for the West Central Initiative Foundation, uh, located in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Uh, she's also the chair of the Governor's Early Learning Council, and she is a lifelong advocate for early childhood education and a consistent voice uh, for greater Minnesota. And I gotta tell you, you know, um, w nothing, well, okay, it's all important, but early childhood, early childhood, early childhood, Nancy, I know you know, you know the whole thing around the brain developing, you know, 80% by the time a baby is three, and just, if we were to, ab if we really got it right, and Nancy, you've been a warrior for so long, and, uh, and we just want to thank you so much. Come on up. This is, I, I feel short today. Usually I feel so tall. Um, I have the honor to, um, on behalf of Start Early Funders Coalition, to present the Children and Youth Champion Award. And today we're going to honor Governor Mark Dayton. And I feel so privileged to be able to do that because he really is a hero of mine because anybody's a hero of mine if they love early childhood and Governor Dayton does. So um, for 14 years, the Children and Youth Issue Briefing has been an opportunity and arena to learn more about early care and education to have important conversations about critical work being done and about issues that need to be addressed across the state. We've been able to elevate early childhood to a critical position of public policy where folks on both sides of the aisle, business and nonprofit leaders and members of the wider Minnesota community now know the importance of it. We have faced budget surpluses and deficits, and yet we've continued to make strides in improving access to high quality early care and education. Many people deserve credit for making these improvements. Without grassroots leadership, whether from parents, early care and education professionals, or other advocates, legislators would not know the true impact of early care and education. It also helps to have a champion who makes early care and education a top level priority. And we have been lucky to have one leading our state, Governor Mark Dayton. Since the start of his administration in 2010, Governor Dayton has made early learning one of the top priorities of his campaign, and the numbers speak for themselves. Since 2010, two billion, not million, billion in new money has been invested in our E12 education, from early learning programs to all day kindergarten and better graduation rates for Minnesota students. With $257 million specifically for early learning. That's incredible. He recognizes the true value of investing early to unlock the true potential of each and every child in Minnesota. These funds have also been invested in special education, school counselors, and support staff, funding for, for facility improvements, initiatives to boost math and reading proficiency, and efforts to close opportunity gaps for students of color and indigenous youth. In 2018, 22,500 Minnesota children will benefit from school-based pre-kindergarten programs and early learning scholarships. 109 Minnesota school districts are receiving state funding for high quality voluntary school-based pre-kindergarten programs. 
6,100 children are enrolled in voluntary school-based pre-K programs across Minnesota this year. 16,400 children will benefit from early learning scholarships this year. The program was expanded, expanded this past session to serve another 4,900 young children so they could attend high-quality high preschool programs. In 2011, Governor Dayton created a first-of-its-kind children's cabinet, consisting of the commissioners of education, human services, and health, to better coordinate policies, programs, and resources across agencies and communities to support improved outcomes for Minnesota's children. The cabinet is focused on ensuring all Minnesota children are healthy, safe, supported, and prepared to achieve their full potential. Since its creation, the cabinet has led efforts to reform Minnesota's early childhood system and expand Minnesota's Help Me Grow system and has advanced policies around voluntary pre-kindergarten, home visiting, health and well-being, and ensuring all Minnesota children have access to the same foundational education opportunities. The cabinet has worked to improve interagency communication and the coordination of services across state government. Due to the governor's busy schedule, he was unable to join us today. We are honored to have Kelly Munson, who is the executive director of the Minnesota Children's Cabinet, here today with us to accept the Children and Youth Champion Award on his behalf. Kelly? Here is the award. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to the sponsors, as well as Start Early. But most of all, a huge thank you to all of you who have worked so hard on behalf of children and families every day. I am honored today to accept this award on, Go award on Governor Dayton's behalf. He shared some words with me before I tell you my own words that I want to share with all of you. He says, all Minnesota children should start school ready to learn, succeed, and grow, no matter where they live in our state. Thanks to new pre-K programs and early learning scholarships, over 22,500 young learners across Minnesota have had access to early education opportunities this year. We must continue working together to ensure that all of our young children can gain the enormous benefits which good early learning experiences can provide. Thank you for your continued commitment to reaching this important and achievable goal. Governor Dayton is correct. We have had much tremendous success over the last seven years. Since taking office, we have increased investments in pre-K, scholarship, home visiting, among other things. However, as he states, there is more work left to do. We must support the whole family and make our systems easier for families to navigate. These are key to successful outcomes, which is why I am pleased that Governor Dayton has added Minnesota Housing, the Department of Employment and Economic Development, the Department of Transportation, and the Met Council to the Children's Cabinet table. Governor Dayton has also directed us to expand our focus areas to housing stability and the recruitment and retention of a high quality early childhood workforce. So while we take this moment to celebrate our successes, we must not get comfortable. We must not move on to the next best thing. We must continue to support this very important work. I promised our host that I would keep it brief. So if there is one message I could leave with you today, it is that there is more work left to accomplish, and we are not done. Thank you. Kelly, thank you so much for um, 
Speaking on behalf of the governor and yourself, thank you for the work that you're doing. Again, thank you so much, Nancy. You know, again, we all know how the importance of the early years and really setting that strong foundation for our children so that they blow us all away. And $241 million, in fact, I had to ask Frank to repeat it again. I said, what did she say? Was that the amount? Um, is absolutely, um, it's a wonderful start. It is a wonderful start. And, and of course, you know, we need more, you know, in terms of the need. And we are, there are a number of early childhood partners here who are part of the Northside Achievement Zone. And uh, if you could just wave your hand in the air, you all, thank you <laughs> all over the place. Thank you so much. And staff, um, we've been focused on early childhood as a collaborative for, um, for like eight years now. And, uh, and it is one of the strongest um, areas of our collaborative. And so it excites me that the Children's Cabinet is, actually has holistic membership now, like really to, to really get holistically uh, to the needs of children uh, and families, because that's certainly what we've been trying to do in the zone. And, and I tell you, Governor Dayton, you know, I mean, we, I don't, I don't care what your partisan, you know, um, persuasion is or anything, Governor Dayton has done a tremendous job for the children of this state. He really has. And, I, and it is consistent, it is consistent with his commitment to equity. I'm on the fourth Judicial Selection Commission and we have never ever had a more diverse bench in the history of this state than we do right now. Because whoever we sent to Governor Dayton, he would say, no, nope, you know, I need to see more diversity. I need to see more people of color. I need to see more women. You know, I mean, constantly doing that. And he was the first governor, for those of you who are on the north side, keep me honest, um, who had visited North Minneapolis in 25 years. He was the first governor who would come to North Minneapolis in 25 years. So anyway, so this is, a man, this is very consistent. All right, right now, I want to introduce someone who's also very consistent. And, uh, and we, Lori Sturdivan is no um, shrinking violet. Uh, we all know Lori very well. She's backed by popular demand. And of course, you know Lori is an editorial writer for the Star Tribune. She's the author of three award-winning books. Um, and she's back here, you loved her. And I tell you the thing, even before I knew Lori, you know, when I did read the paper, I went to her section because I felt like it was always balanced and it was always relevant and like she was somebody that I could connect with and uh, in my community and just spoke the truth, you know, in a, in a, in, and in a compassionate way. Lori, you're never like tearing people down, you know, but you know, it is, um, it, it is the truth and thank you and never, ever, ever stop writing, Lori. <laughs> thank you, Lori. Thank you, Sandra, for those sweet words, and I won't uh, make a commitment on that last point. But, <laughs> but what a joy to be with you and to see such a big group gathered here again to deal with, of course, the most important thing that the state does. It, it's as reflected in our state budget. 50% of the state budget goes in some way or another to our next generation. And I would say that even a little more should be going that way when we think about the challenges the state faces. It's an exciting year. It's a gubernatorial election year. I've been doing this sort of work at the Star Tribune for a long time, and, and you asked, Sandra, the students, what excites you? Well, what excites me is a gubernatorial campaign in Minnesota because we do this in a very special way in Minnesota. We trot candidates around the state. I think in 2010, the last time we had an open gubernatorial seat, the candidates met in something like three dozen forums before audiences like this in a variety of configurations, not all of them participated in every single event, but we expect to have a hands-on touch opportunity, a, a personal listening opportunity, a personal questioning and dialogue opportunity with our gubernatorial candidates. And here we go again with an open seat. So I'd like to invite the three gubernatorial candidates who are with us today to join me on the stage. And while they make their way up, I'd like to mention that we have a few other 
legislators in the audience who deserve a little attention for being here. We have three state senators, Senator Greg Clausen, Senator Patricia torres Ray, and Senator Melissa Wickland. We have three state representatives, State Representative Dave Pinto, Representative Jim Davney, and Representative Cal Barr. Let's have a round of applause for those legislators for joining us today. And now you will find on your uh, uh, tables, you will just we'll move now. You'll find on your tables the uh, uh, bio sheets for these gubernatorial candidates, including, I believe, some gubernatorial candidates who uh, were in the race until recently and then left us. At one point, we thought this might be a, a group of about six or seven candidates here, and we're, we've got three good ones here today. But uh, the, the, the ranks have been depleted by some changes in that gubernatorial lineup in the last few weeks. But still, we have, uh, I'll start at the end, Former State Representative Keith Downing, uh, also a former State Republican Party chair, represented the city of Edinum primarily in his district and served on two education-related committees, K-12 and higher ed, as I recall, when you were in the state legislature. And right? early childhood. And early childhood, too. So a big dose of that kind of policy in your background. We have Representative Erin Murphy. I will say she is my representative in St. Paul. She's uh, been working pr primarily in the human services area and is a, uh, a nurse with a, a good background in healthcare. And Representative Tina Liebling from Rochester joining us. Uh, she also has been working heavily in the health policy arena. So the, welcome, candidates, and we're gonna put you through your paces here. We talked at some point about having timed answers, and we thought, no, with just three, let's just have a conversation. That's what's so valuable about this <clears throat> kind of event here. So I'd like to talk about the challenges of early education, that, to start there, because we've spent so much time on that in the legislature, and we found a, a good deal to, to argue about with early childhood over the years. I want to talk about access today, I want to talk about affordability, and I want to talk about quality. Let's, let's start with, with the access question, if you would. Um, we have, uh, uh, this. by the way, some of these questions have come from all of you from various groups of, in the state who have submitted them in advance, and for that, we want to thank you. Um, did I say access? No, let's maybe start with affordability. Child care is an expensive thing in Minnesota. I've seen rankings that suggest we are maybe the second or third highest expense uh, child care state in the country for families. And, and many parents are finding that their child care costs them every, mo every month as much as their rent or their mortgage payment. And yet we have child care teachers that are among the lowest paid professionals. Their median hourly wage in Minnesota in 2015 was less than $11 an hour. What ideas do you have to make child care more affordable in Minnesota for families? And we'll just go down the line and start with former representative Keith Downey. Sure, thank you uh, for having me, glad to be here. Um, so I think the, the premise of the question is that there should be a heavily uh, subsidized government uh, involved uh, early childhood and child care system. And from my perspective, I think that's starting from the wrong point. Um, my own perspective is that strong families are the best place to provide early child care and to provide early learning. And so when we look at all the public policy and all of the costs associated with it to compensate for the fact that families aren't strong and that father absence is a huge problem uh, that uh, propagates all of the need uh, for these systems and programs, I, I just want to make sure that as governor that I would be leading on the things that will actually fundamentally change the circumstances that precipitate this cost problem. So uh, I, I'll, I'm glad to talk about the systems and the programs and things, but I just want to make sure that people understand where I'm coming from uh, at the very beginning. Uh, we have a set of systemic uh, things that are occurring in society uh, that result in this, and I think that's where our focus needs to be. Okay, well, that's one perspective. I, I have a feeling that we'll hear something else from Representative Murphy and Representative Liebling about the cost of child care and making it more affordable for families. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Lori, and I'm really delighted uh, to be with you today to talk about uh, the next phase of the work that we're going to do together uh, as Minnesotans to make sure our kids get a very bright start. 
And as I have spent my time with Minnesotans over the last 11 years as an elected official, I find most often the very best ideas, the best solutions, uh, the path forward come from the people of Minnesota. So I have a good example when we talk about child care and the problems, affordability, accessibility, et cetera. I was in New York Mills uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, in New York Mills, they are trying very hard to make sure that they have access access to and then to affordable child care in that community. And for two years now, they have been working together uh, to find a solution creating a cooperative child care center in that community. Uh, they need a little help. They just need a little bit of help from the state, some seed money, maybe a little bit of bonding money. At a table in New York Mills are city councilors, the mayor, the county commissioner, a couple of leaders from Head Start, and the top employers from that community because they know together if they can unlock this issue of affordable and accessible childcare, they're gonna have a stronger workforce in their community and they believe they're gonna be able to attract people to come and live in that community. So when you, I listen to the leaders in New York Mills, I hear them talking about childcare as a fundamental piece of their infrastructure to build the community um, to attract families to come and live there and work there and earn a good living. That's why this is so important and why I disagree somewhat with um, representative, former representative Mr. Downey, um, that we have to think through how we are participating in uh, the economy, how we're living our lives. I, I was happy to go back to work when my kids were born. I'm the mother of twins. Uh, I worked for the Minnesota Nurses Association. I stayed home with them when they were infants, but went back to work part-time, and I needed to find accessible childcare in order to go back and do the work that I chose to do to support my family. So this question of childcare and its affordability is really fundamental uh, to our way of life, to our state's economy, uh, to the choices that people are able to make in a free, uh, free society. And that's why the work that you're doing together and this question is so important for us. I don't know that there is one simple answer to affordability. Um, and as I listen to people in different parts of the state, I think we're gonna have to think through new models, um, maybe loosen up a little bit of the regulation that make childcare uh, hard to conduct. And when I think about the New York Mills, uh, issue. That's one of the things they're bumping up against. Uh, so we have to open up our thinking a little bit to make this work going forward so that women and men and families can participate in our society but also provide affordable child care. Representative Liebling, I remember that one of your predecessors from Rochester at the legislature, Representative Fran Bradley, was in, in office in 2003 and was the principal pusher for a major cut in a program called CCAP. Then it was called Basic Sliding Fee Child Care. And we've really been dealing with a, a, a struggle to pay for child care ever since. What are your thoughts about this affordability question? Well, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to be here. And I just want to say before I start answering the question, I was so inspired by these young people. Thank you so much. I didn't see all of it, but you're just dynamite. It really lifted my spirits. So thank you very much. So there's very little that's more important in our state than how our kids get started in life. I mean, this is just a critical issue. And I agree that Governor Dayton's done a lot of really great work to move us forward. But we have to really look at the big picture. When we think about childcare affordability, we have to recognize the cost of living has gone up, but wages have not gone up to keep pace. This is the world we're living in. There's a tremendous concentration of wealth and power in fewer and fewer hands. And this is making a bigger and bigger gap between what people are able to earn and what it takes to live. And the cost of childcare is just one piece of that. And it's a really important piece because no parent can really feel comfortable working if they don't know that their children are in a safe and healthy and nourishing place. And I know that very well. I have three children. I know I'm blessed to have a grandchild. And this issue about being able to work when you don't think your child is being well taken care of, I mean, that's not good for anyone. It's not good for employers. It's not good for our state. So I think the investment in the CCAP program, and by the way, Fran Bradley was in the district next door, not my, not my district, but <laughs> nevertheless, Yes, uh, from Rochester, absolutely. I mean, I have, in my door knocking, I'm in my seventh term, I've run eight times as a legislator, and I've door knocked people who said, thank you for the CCAP program, the Child Care Assistance Program, I don't wanna 
give you a bunch of acronyms, but this program where we help lower income parents pay for childcare so that they can work. Because people don't want a handout. They want to be able to take care of their families. They want to pull themselves up. And so we're not going to solve all the world's problems like uh, Rep former Representative Downey wants to, you know, wait till the world is perfect before we help people. I, I don't think that's how we're going to do it. I think we need to help people where they are right now and focus on this. And one of the issues I think is um, that I, I think the idea of using our, our public school system to increase the availability of, of voluntary programming is a good one and takes the pressure off a lot of parents. Let's talk about that very point as, our, as we continue this conversation. We've had uh, several years now of lively debate at the legislature whether, about whether we, it is good policy to pr uh, proceed with universal school district-based uh, child care or pr other preschool for four-year-olds. Uh, and, and the tension has been over the, the cost of that program and whether that money might be better spent on uh, means-tested scholarships that would reach not just four-year-olds, but children from birth through age five. There's been tension between those two policies. We've just given an award to Governor Dayton, who strongly has supported the universal approach. What are your views about that debate, and where would you come down on that? And well, Representative Leveling, you just said a few words about that, so why don't we start with you and say a little more about how you have analyzed that, that, that tension. Well, I am a strong supporter of public education. And I think our public schools on the whole do a very good job and that we ought to support our public schools and that that, because public schools are everywhere and families are able to access them, I think that's a really good place to start. I'm not against the scholarship idea, but I think that what, what tends to happen is programs that are for the poor only tend to be poor programs. When you have programs that are for everyone, you get more societal buy-in to them. They tend to be more sustainable, and that's one of the reasons that I like the public school approach. It's been said that uh, it, going that way puts, uh, uh, dis it re greatly disrupts the business model of existing, cent especially center-based childcare, and that's one reason not to go that way. What's your response to that concern? Well. Um, you know, I'm not against people having a private business, but I think that childcare is a societal necessity. And so I'm more concerned about the children and the parents than I am about the businesses. And at the same time, we're hearing there's not accessibility and it's too expensive. So I think parents need the option to, um, you know, have this other model. I mean, I think if, you know, uh, businesses have to adapt. And Representative Murphy, where have you come down on this tension between universal preschool and a scholarship-based approach? Uh, in my very first term, I was on the Early Childhood Committee, uh, and there I was, you know, uh, informed, like so many of you in the room, about the value of early learning. You know, listening to Art Rolnick and Arthur Reynolds and others talking about that early investment uh, and that early intervention to make sure that everyone's got a really bright spark. So that is the foundation for me. I have been uh, the author of the pre-K legislation in the Minnesota House of Representatives, so I feel like I have been in the midst of, maybe in the middle of, um, that debate that we've been having in the legislature around voluntary pre-K um, and child care and scholarships. And I was lucky, I think, to partner in the very beginning with my former colleague, Ryan Winkler, who had been working on scholarships. And we both agreed that there is room here, right, for uh, a durable and ongoing investment in early learning, um, one not to exclude the other. So in many ways in my career, I feel like I have straddled divisions that can hurt our goal in order to try and bring people together around an idea that together we can, we can move forward um, if we can get around the political divides that sometimes make false options for us. And I will say, in my many years now of working on this issue, I have watched this community um, come together around the idea that if we put our kids first and our communities first, we can find our path forward. And as I have visited childcare centers and family childcare in homes, uh, 
ECFE families, schools, all over the state of Minnesota, I am watching communities taking sort of the disparate funds that the state is providing and cobbling together, in some cases, a durable commitment to early learning in their communities. And that's where I am informed on the work that I think we need to go forward doing together. We need flexibility, absolutely. But more importantly to me, we need a real commitment on the direction that we're going forward. So I do support pre-K. I think it's important it's in its schools. Our schools are often hubs in communities. Um, and for especially new Minnesotans, they are a place where we gather and recognize this is where we come together to make sure our kids are getting a really great education. Uh, but I, I, I want to make sure that across the state, as communities are working to make this commitment to their kids, that we're hearing their perspective and informing ourselves in the policy going forward. And as the state's governor, this is a real priority for me. It will be a continuation of the work that I've been doing with you. I'm really proud of the progress we're making, but there is absolutely more that we need to do. Well, and Keith Downey, this debate over uh, universal pre-K versus scholarships really kind of came to the fore. After you left the legislature, you've been able to watch it up close as a, as a Republican Party chair. What is, where have you come down on this conversation? Well, actually, the first uh, instance and in funding of uh, the early learning scholarships was actually in my last term and when I was on the early education committee, so I think I have a good perspective on this. Um, I'm, I'll talk about the specifics here because I want to answer your question, but then I want to address a comment that Representative Liebling uh, made. I, I don't favor universal uh, pre-K. Um, I don't know that most school districts favor that in terms of their capacity and their ability uh, to pull it off. Um, I also think when we talk about the cost issue, um, this crippling cost issue, uh, you institutionalize all early learning systems in the K-12 education system and you have dramatically blown up the cost structure uh, of that system. It's all unionized, it's got to have the administrative oversight and all the auditing and all these systems and the checks and balances. And if you think costs are high for uh, early child care and early learning now, just wait till you uh, uh, systematize it within the K-12 system. And so to the extent that we feel we have an obligation to have government help fund early learning, I think the scholarship model makes sense, but not for low-income people. For the highest at-risk kids, is there merit in our system to provide a scholarship, a voucher, for those families to find the child care and the early learning environment that works for them? I think we could argue that. I'd argue that in the K-12 system as well. And this boils back to a point that Representative Liebling made, and, and I, I reject this out of hand, that somehow poor people and people in poverty are going to build poor structures and poor systems somehow implies that they aren't capable, oh, their kids aren't capable. No, let me, we're having a conversation, right? This is a, this is a big back point. back to you, Representative Tell Lee. the truth. <laughs> let's, have a, let's, have a, let's have a conversation here. And I'm telling you, one of the merits of the early learning scholarships and vouchers in the K-12 system is that if I'm governor, I walk into a room like this and I look every single person in the room and I tell them, I believe in you, and I trust in you to make a great decision for your kids. And this notion that we have to build this massive universal system because we're so much smarter and we care so much more than all these other people who might make a good decision for their families with a voucher, I reject that. And I think the people in the urban core and the places where they have at-risk families and at-risk kids need to know that we do trust in them and we believe in them. And that's the foundation for me for supporting early learning scholarships, not the big institutions. We have decimated in-home family child care by trying to unionize it. We hardly have half of the, the in-home daycares that we used to have because we're systematizing and unionizing and putting all these requirements on them, and they just get out of the business. So the most customized, the highly tailored things where a family can work something out with their neighbor or a cousin or whatever, we're starting to shut all that down, and so we can believe in our families and our kids and our neighborhoods. Early learning scholarships help us do that. I would support them only for the most highest at-risk kids. Well, Keith Downey, you just used that electric, politically electric word voucher, and so I'm sure that we'll, we'll let, we can't let that pass without giving uh, Representative Murphy and Representative Liebling a chance to respond to that, and Representative Liebling, I'll let you go first. Well, um, 
I think that Mr. Downey probably should know that, that in fact, family child cares didn't get unionized. So if that's what caused all the problems, I, I think you've got to think again. They actually didn't get unionized. So, you know, let's, let's start um, with the facts there. But, of course, when I say that programs for the poor are poor programs, it's not because people who are poor have something wrong with them. I don't think that people are responsible for being poor. I think that, that very often the conditions around us give, don't give people the opportunities to pull themselves up. And this idea that somehow going out and I, I love, actually I love Mr. Downey's slogan when he says, I believe in you. When I first heard that, I said, I know what that means. That means you're on your own. That's what that means. It means you're on your own. Representative Murphy, what are your, what's your reaction to what you just heard from Mr. Downey? I am. Um... <laughs> be honest, we're having a conversation. I know, I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna be honest. Uh, for a long time, I think we have uh, found our way uh, to short-term electoral success uh, by baiting each other into a debate like we're hearing right now. Uh, we're here together today to talk about Minnesota kids and our future, and we absolutely have different points of view. Um, but as I listen to this conversation right now, um, I worry about the state of uh, the rhetoric ahead in this election, um, because it is, I think, very much intended to divide us, and we can't continue to tolerate that. We can't continue to afford that. And I grew up in a family that talked about politics, and it's something that I really believe in. Uh, but it has got to be about us again. It has to be about us again. And we will have different points of view, and that's, that's good, right? It is the kind of governance that we have chosen in this country, uh, that all the, all the opinions, all of what we think uh, gets to come to the debate, and then we get to make a decision. Uh, but I'm hearing the tracks of a kind of rhetoric that uh, I, I understand what it's about, and it's no good for us. Uh, thank you. Good night. Thank you. And I, I just want to finish in the, in the conversational form in which we're um, working today. I spent a little time uh, at Bethune Elementary just last week. Um, just last week, a uh, sweet school uh, in a classroom with this group of kids. Uh, and I spent some time talking with the educators in that, in that school as well before school started that day. And I saw in that room a group of professionals who had their attention in part on me and someplace else. And I asked, you know, where's your head today? And of course they were heading into the classroom, so they were thinking about their day. But they're also thinking about the state of the school in Minneapolis, their school. And the choices in front of them if the funding that comes from the state is inadequate for the job that they have to do. And this is a story that I see all over the state of Minnesota. This is not just an urban school issue. There are schools across the state that are doing their very best job. Administrators and educators and staff doing their very best job. But we have continued to politicize and underfund education in ways that makes it very difficult for the people who care deeply uh, for the work that they do, those professionals, and for the people in their charge uh, to get the job done well. And what I saw in that room that morning was that fatigue and worry uh, on the part of a group of people who have a very important job to do and we're not giving them enough help. That's where I want to focus my voice and my attention as the state's governor. And while it might not always be the most popular way to campaign because it's not so much red meat, I do think it is time for us to focus on what we are able to accomplish together. And I know that we've got it in us to do this very important job to make sure that we are closing the opportunity gap for our kids that starts before kids come to school, um, to make sure that everybody who's going to school has a real shot at the full blessing, the full measure of opportunity in the state of Minnesota. That's our job, right? Representative Downey, yeah, I, know I, you, I, know, I know you want back in on this, but I'd like to give you just a little bit of additional input to. to, to just guide the conversation in a little different direction, teeing up on something you just mentioned. Uh, you talked about uh, the cost that would be associated with a unionized workforce for early education. That is a concern. It's also a concern that we have exceedingly low wages right now in this field, and that is making it hard to attract and keep a quality workforce. It's, it's uh, of, you can tell by the applause, it's of concern. 
uh, that, that that workforce is not as big as it should be in Minnesota. It's contributing to the, ch the problem of childcare deserts, which have been identified both in rural Minnesota and in the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. What should, what should be the state's response to this problem of insufficient uh, supply of quality workers in the early ed area? And Representative Downey, I'll let you start. Well, if, if I could, I w I'm glad to answer that question, but I, I do need to respond, and I, I think that's totally unfair uh, to somehow diminish uh, my perspective as though somehow it's just blatant politics. That's not it at all. You know, my dad is a public school teacher, 35 years. I was raised by 20 teachers and their families. That was my upbringing. I'm proud of that, very proud of it. And at the same time, I sat on all the education committees, every single one, K-12 education, higher education, K-12 policy, and early education while I was in the legislature. And I hate to say it, but I don't think I saw the needle move. We had an achievement gap problem that was exposed to the measurement systems of No Child Left Behind, and they didn't change, hardly at all. The institutionalized kind of union bureaucratic complex fights every change at every turn. And so for me, from my perspective, I look at that and I say the solution isn't bigger institutionalization, more bureaucracy, more state control, bigger administrative overhead. I see the solution as being parental choice and trusting parents to make a great decision with their education dollar. That's not a device of political device. That is not. That's a passionate belief of mine that if we are going to improve education in this state, if we're going to correct at that achievement gap and the resulting opportunity gap, we have to empower parents to make the choices that are the best for them and their families. And the institutionalization and the growth of the bureaucracy absolutely increases the cost, no doubt about it. And the loss from whatever it was, 11,000 down to maybe seven, six or 7,000 in-home childcare providers in the last five or so years during the big unionization push, that's part of our problem. And so I think as compared to further coercing the child care and daycare and early education market with government controls and government funding and government direction and one size fits all, that we are far better off with a scholarship model and a choice model because then parents can choose what works for them, what's affordable for them. The providers can figure out a construct that's affordable and that works for them and, and the, the parents and the families they're serving. So again, just this fundamental belief in our people and our families and our neighborhoods and our teachers and our local schools is what guides me. It is not a political device. We can have a legitimate policy discussion uh, but it's not born out of the fact that somebody's playing politics and somebody else isn't. Uh, that's totally unfair and inaccurate. And, and in that, if I may, I agree with Mr. Downey. And I also want to say that he shows up as a Republican. He shows up to some of these events where his, his uh, people he's running against do not. So I think he gets the Courage Award for that, don't you think? Yeah. Well, let me, let me ask, re rephrase my, or renew my question. Would the approach that you're advocating, Representative Downey, move the needle with regard to the uh, supply of well-qualified, well-trained early educators? In, in my opinion, it absolutely would. I mean, supply typically follows demand. Uh, <laughs> if there's a group of parents empowered with a voucher or an early, or early education scholarship, whatever term you want to use, uh, typically in a free system, Guess what? The supply shows up to meet the demand. And because those parents have choices, guess what? It gets even higher quality over time. So I, I really firmly believe that that's the solution. Um, and again, this notion that the person who cares the most is the person who writes the biggest checks for the biggest you know, public programs, I, I just disagree with that. And I think we're, we're proving on a lot of different fronts that that kind of a choice model uh, can work. Here with our opportunity scholarships done in Milwaukee County and Racine County in Wisconsin, uh, with their voucher program, uh, charters and choice options here uh, all across this state. Uh, I think we're proving that those things can work and I would favor that from a policy and a funding standpoint. And what would the dollar amount be associated with that? We've heard that, our, for example, universal pre-K costs about $450 million a year in Minnesota. What's the dollar, the price tag on the scholarship program that you envision? Uh, I, I don't have a price tag on that. Um, in in my opinion, providing some kind of an amount that serves the most at-risk kids, 
the highest at-risk kids would be where I would land. It would be, I, it would be means tested, not universal, the scholarship approach. Um, if means tested means simply income based, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do that. I just, I, I don't feel that the poor, that poor people are somehow less capable of, of raising their kids and getting them ready for kindergarten. I think there's a risk factor uh, in terms of English abilities and other factors that would play into it. Uh, income might be a halfway decent proxy, but all of a sudden you're telling every poor person out there, you're the people who can't raise your kids. I, I just reject that. My, my mother-in-law, my parents, they grew up with nothing. And they turned out awesome because their families were solid and they believed in their kids and they got them the opportunities that they need. That's the message we need to give to our parents. And scholarships do that. Big institutionalized systems do not. And they cost way too much okay. and don't work very well. Okay, let's get, get Representative Murphy and then Representative Liebling into this conversation about how we increase the supply of uh, well-trained, well-qualified child care workers. So when I think about a uh, uh, teacher uh, working uh, in preschool versus a teacher working in kindergarten, there is an absolute uh, pay differential, um, both in salary and in benefits. And so you will watch people come into early learning uh, and then make the choice to go into the K-12 system in order to improve um, their financial situation. And so if we want to make sure we've got high qualified uh, well-qualified, prepared educators in the zero to four range, then we have to pay attention to what they're being paid. I was a supporter of child care unionization, and all we did at the state legislature is say to uh, people who work in child care, you, if you choose to, can organize. Uh, those child care providers across the state took a vote and said, no, that's democracy. That's the choice that they made. Uh, it didn't really add any costs, as I can see. Um, but we know that we have child care deserts uh, already in, in the state of Minnesota. We know we have a workforce shortage, not just in education, um, but in many of the professions and in many of the places in the state of Minnesota, which I think means we have to open up our lens and think through how are we making sure Minnesota is a place where people want to come to live and work. Um, how do we make this place a place that attracts new talent and new people to make sure that we've got a workforce not just in education and early learning, but in healthcare, in manufacturing, um, in the jobs that build our future? That fundamental question um, is one that we, I think, as a people, have to put squarely on the table to answer. And when we do that, and then we invest a little bit more in the work that I've been doing on pre-K, it does envision funding for um, the education or the completion of education for those who choose to go back um, to get their uh, baccalaureate license or their baccalaureate education and licensure, if that's what they choose to do. Uh, the data is the data's really clear that high quality educators mean a high quality education. Um, I've also done a fair amount of work on family, friend, and neighbor child care because we know that child care is being provided in settings in people's homes, um, and we need to continue to make sure that is high quality as well um, because it's a choice that lots and lots of people are making across the state of Minnesota. So uh, I know you already know this, right? The work that you have been doing uh, is, uh, if you will, a loose system, right? Now, maybe not a fully articulated system, but a loose system that is supporting kids and families. I like that. I think that works because it gives us flexibility across the state to do our very best in our communities. Uh, but we have to make sure that we are rewarding work. And rewarding work means pay, especially for women and people who are working with the children. And Representative Liebling, what's the state's role in this regard? And how best can the state address this worker shortage in the early ed area? Well, first of all, I want to just say that I don't think there's anything illegitimate about having a debate here. We're here because we're running for governor, all three of us. So, you know, we're all here to present our points of view, and there are different points of view. And if we're going to have a, a race for governor in which we say it's not legitimate to, you know, have a back and forth, then I don't know what we're all doing here and giving you an opportunity to see the differences between us. So, thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, I wanted to just first respond to Mr. Downey, who said that, you know, this is somehow about um, being uh, disrespecting poor parents. You know, um, for one thing, we're talking about voluntary childcare. Nobody's talking about forcing parents to put their children in childcare anywhere. So let's just, I think that's a bit of a straw man argument. The other thing is that low income parents are the ones who most need to work. If we're telling people, 
we don't want you on welfare, and, and I could talk about that too, by the way, just in a small digression. You know, the amount of money, the cash grant for a family on our welfare, quote unquote, our Minnesota Family Investment Program, has not gone up since 1986. We have to keep talking about that. We have people in deep, deep poverty in this state, children who are actually on our public programs and still in deep, deep poverty. That's a risk factor right there. So we got to do something about that. And I've been trying to, and I've been talking about that for a very long time. Anyway, what was your question, Lori? Sorry. <laughs> well, I, I think we were talking about the shortage of, of, yes. of workers, but you know, yeah. I, we, we're also looking at the time. You can yeah. talk, pick up and talk not only about the shortage of workers in, in the early ed area, yes. but in K-12 as well. This yes. is, is there a special responsibility for state government in addressing a workforce shortage in this particular area in which the state plays such a strong role? Yeah, I, and I think that there is. We have, of course, shortages across all of our workforce. We're hearing this everywhere we go. And this is, of course, part of the aging demographics. More people are older, more people are retiring. There are fewer younger people, although I understand the millennial generation is really big, too. But one thing that we've done, and this goes back to my opening statement about what's happened in our economy, the burden of student debt is just tremendous. And people who would like to get education and would like to do these jobs don't feel that they can. And I, so I think one of the things a state really can do, should do, is really put money into loan forgiveness for people who work in certain shortage important areas, like giving our kids the best possible start. I can hardly think of a more important area than that. And, um, and helping, you know, and I have a proposal for two years tuition-free college or vocational school, which I think would help because we want to encourage people to go into those fields without worrying about taking on a ton of debt. So I think those are a couple of things. And we have to raise the minimum wage and make it a real living wage because you cannot really even have a basic needs budget right now. Even at $15 an hour, by the way, in many parts of the state that doesn't even give you a living wage today. That, there is something seriously wrong with that. Representative Murphy and then Representative Downey, what is the state's role in addressing the teacher shortage, both in the early ed area and in K-12? I, um, I know that Minnesotans value education. Uh, they talk about it all the time. Uh, they give it high priority. I also know that uh, Minnesota is, uh, well, so proud of many things. The most, second most unequal state um, when we think about disparities and structural racism. And we see that in education, we see it in health outcomes, we see it in earning potential, especially for women of color. Uh, we see it in incarceration rates and policing. Uh, and that's not something to be proud of. And I, I remember when I was the majority leader, um, having a conversation in the, in the office uh, with a group of people talking about the opportunity gap and there being those heads going down and a little bit of shame. Like, we're, like it's so hard to talk about it because it is the case um, and we haven't solved it. We need to solve it. I know lots of educators uh, come out of school, they get their job, um, they leave their job, right? Because- a 50% turnover. It yeah. is, uh, and so we have lots of licensed teachers in the state of Minnesota who are not teaching. Um, that's a symptom that we need to pay attention to. We need to bring them back to school. And as I'm listening to this discussion and talking about vouchers and parental choice, yes, Parents, Minnesotans, we love the options before us. We love to be able to make a choice. Let's make sure all our schools are awesome. So parents have, wherever they live, a great choice to make. That, I think, is the way that we invest in our communities and in our schools. We know how to do that part, but we have been, since 2003, behind in terms of funding for our schools, and it is contributing to the burnout of our educators. And that's contributing then to the opportunity gap for our kids. I think it's time for us to focus on, focus on teachers of color. I love the work that's being done in the Promise neighborhood and the Northside Achievement Zone. I love full service community schools. We have models right in front of us that we know that work. And we're the people to make that work. We just gotta make the commitment and stop playing politics with our kids' education. 
Representative Downey, good Well, thoughts. I think it's way simpler than that. We have far too many licensed teachers in administration because of the bureaucratic compliance uh, nightmare that we impose on our local schools and the lack of freedom uh, that they have. Uh, secondly, too many young uh, teachers uh, come into the school and run into the buzzsaw uh, called last in, first out, uh, and they get demoralized uh, by the fact that advancement and even having some constancy uh, in their profession is dictated by these arbitrary union rules that don't reward uh, the highest performing teachers. And so uh, I think putting uh, uh, some competition into the system and allowing the best teachers to advance and make more money, uh, that makes all the sense uh, in the world to me. And, and back to this question about funding and, and whether or not we have this commitment. Um, I remember when I left the legislature, the K-12 biennial budget, I think, was $13 billion. And it's $18 billion now, $5 billion. The state budget for education went up in the five years since I left. That's like three or four times GDP growth. We are pouring money after money <laughs> into these systems and these structures, and they aren't producing the results, I'm sorry. You got great school districts all across the state. We have awesome teachers all across the state. And you know what? They're operating in this system that doesn't reward performance and success. In fact, we actually have rewards in our systems for failure. We're going to provide more money to a failing school, as though money is the actual solution. If it were, we would have fixed it years ago. So we have got to look harder at this. I'm, I'm telling you, if we, if we care, and I, I look at these statistics, the, the graduation rate is inching up in, in some of these school districts, but achievement isn't, test scores isn't. We're just dropping the bar so kids can get through. We aren't equipping our kids. 50% graduation rates, 40 or 60% graduation rates. Where's the outrage? I'm outraged. Seriously, we got to do something. We can't just sit here and, and give speeches about how much we care and how much we care is defined by how much money we keep pouring into this stuff. We have an opportunity under the next governor to look the people in those communities in the eye and tell them that we believe in them and that we're going to give them the choices to make great decisions for their families and their kids. And guess what? The evidence is out there that that will work. We will have kids who are better prepared for kindergarten. We will have higher graduation and achievement results if we do it. But we got to be strong enough to make that case and get the people behind us so that we can actually do it and make the change that we all want for this state. There are people in this audience who have submitted questions about two topics that I think we could answer with rather short answers, so we have time to get onto one more topic other than, high, than early ed. So let's talk about uh, those two topics real quickly, and we'll just go down the line here, starting with Representative Liebling. What is, what is your view of parent aware, the rating system? Is, should it be funded better, and is, is, is it serving its, you know, its right for the role it was intended when it was created about 10 years ago? And what about home visiting, which was uh, funded with a little bit of money in this budget, and there are folks who can cite data that it, it, it's a, an effective way to help close some of the gaps we were just talking about. Those two things, parent aware, home visiting. Representative Liebling, okay, well, short thanks, answers. Thanks for asking about home visiting. I'm a huge proponent of home visiting. I serve on Health and Human Services. I think we should offer home visiting to every family in this state. Every family that has a new child should have an opportunity to have a home visit. That, okay, so that's that one. Parent aware, I, um, for me, the jury's out a little bit. I think raising standards and making sure that people have tools to do a better job is always a good thing. Let me just say that. Uh, as a nurse, I have been a home visitor uh, with the Visiting Nurses Association, and I think it's awesome that educators are home visiting as well, and that connection between school and family and strong families is really critical. Um, so I'm a big supporter of home visiting in both those arenas, and it's hard for me to separate healthcare and education because they, they come together when I think about humans and our well-being. Uh, in terms of parent aware, we've done so much work in the state of Minnesota. And the one thing I think we have to pay attention to right now, especially in times of shortage, is those that are providing child care, especially in greater Minnesota right now, are stepping outside of parent aware uh, because they're avoiding the, the work that needs to be done because they've got a waiting list and they don't need that rating. Um, so I think we have to pay attention to that to make sure that the process of going through parent aware isn't so burdensome that it makes it easy for people to opt out because it doesn't it's not relevant to them in their communities. Okay. Representative Downey, parent aware and home visiting. 
Uh, I lost the argument when I was in the legislature about making sure that the parent aware system would be administered outside uh, the state bureaucracies. Um, my preference would be uh, that a, a private sector entity of some type, nonprofit, uh, would administer parent aware so it doesn't get trapped in uh, all of the ideology and, and bureaucratic processes. Um, with regard to uh, home visiting, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of mediating institutions throughout this state who can do that without the state government taking over home visiting. I mean, if you think about the vision of what is being cast here, that the state government <laughs> would provide universal school for every kid who's three and older, and then guess what, we're down to two and one in a couple of years, and that the state government should run a home visiting program for every single person in this state. I mean, first of all, the costs are just un unimaginable, and second, is that really the vision for our society and our future that we want? Can we not trust our families? Can we not trust our churches and our local free associations to actually do some of these things? Seriously, we have to take a look. This, the Minnesota ethic is being lost. I was raised here. All the, all the wonderful things, the parents and the grandparents and the churches and the Lions Clubs and all these things that used to be out there. And now we're sitting here and we're up, we've got people on this panel saying, no, they can't do that. We've got to have a state-funded program to do it. I just fundamentally disagree with that. I, I, I trust the people of Minnesota and what we have always done here uh, in this state far more than I trust the Department of Human Services and the Education Department to manage and administer and tax for all this stuff. I, I have to say um, that I remember this experience of doing a home visit. Um, I, I was uh, with a, a nurse who was doing home visiting. Uh, we were in the home of a young woman who just had a baby. Um, she had another child. She was living in a home with multiple other adults uh, because she was living in poverty. She had one bedroom for herself and those two children, including that um, infant. Uh, I remember the top of the dresser being everything that she owned to care for that new baby. Uh, and I was left with this impression, like forever in my life, this impression. Uh, that we make it very, very difficult uh, for people who are living in poverty to work their way up the economic ladder. And so when I think about what, and I'm trying really hard to be open here, right, in our conversation, when I think about uh, the notion that I don't trust her, I do trust her. Um, but there are systems that have been put in place that make it so hard for that woman to work her way up successfully and caring for her child. And I think that when I think about my work ahead, I put myself in her shoes, in those shoes, and wanna make sure that the Minnesota, the Minnesota that we're building, the opportunity that we're building for people is realistic, um, that it really recognizes the hardship of poverty. I want her to succeed in raising her child. I am sure you do too. Uh, but I think we have to be eyes wide open about the challenges that people face. And some of those are the things that we put in front of them in order to achieve political accountability. Um, and we need to put more humanness into this and a little more faith in her ability if we give her the tools to do the job that she's meant to do. Short response, yeah. That, Short response. Very, very brief. Short response, please. That's, that's a great story. And I think our, our hearts are in the same place. The question is whether a bigger bureaucratic regime funding all of these things actually improves these systems. And I think the evidence is out there that it does not. And so the, the notion that we can just get all these things bigger and more expensive and more comprehensive, that it's going to improve that, I just don't think, I don't think that happens. Well, candidates, I promised Frank Forsberg that we would get in a few questions, maybe just one about, about the, what's going on in our post-secondary and, and our, the relationship between our high schools and our, our post-secondary career pathways work. So we have, we're down to the wire here. Can, can I squeeze in one and we'll, we'll allow, the, 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 allow this conversation about early ed to continue in the, the uh, for the foyer here when we're done. Uh, we heard a pre presentation from our friends in Hutchinson earlier today. I don't know if all of you were here yet when that happened about the innovative work that's being done in the high school in Hutchinson concerning connecting students to their eventual careers and giving them the, the supports already in high school to make that happen. There's innovation on this realm of, of connecting uh, high school students to post-secondary and, and to their career pathways all over the state, lots of variations. And some folks are saying that the state's academic standards or the state's requirements are getting in the way. What is the state's role in pursuing this kind of, of innovation 
in, in high school so that we can have people ready for careers in Minnesota when our workforce is so short. And Representative Liebling, I'll start with you. So I think it's good to, you know, we're, we're in this world where students don't have a lot of extra resources and they're afraid to spend years kind of casting around for what's my career going to be. And um, so I think it's good that some of these pathways are being offered. I'm sorry I didn't hear the presentation earlier. I know there's a lot of creative work being done, people really trying to do this career pathway work. I just want to add to that that it concerns me a little bit that we're not sometimes valuing education for its own sake, too. And I think it's really important. Our, our state constitution talks about the value of an educated electorate. And I think that's really important. We don't want to lose that in our rush to plug into careers, as important as that is. So when I hear these young people doing their presentation up here and how talented they are and talking about how they're developing themselves and finding themselves, and I think that's really critical stuff, too. So I'm, I'm hoping that we as a state can, can do both. I mean, it's really important to give people the tools they need to be to have a career, and the world is changing really fast. But part of what people need is a sense of themselves and a sense that they can do stuff and aren't afraid to try. Thank you. It, it, Representative Murphy, in such a highly regulated system as, as our K-12 system has been, what is the state's role now in allowing this kind of, of flexible transformation to occur? I, I'm sorry I missed the presentation on Hutchinson, but I also want to say there is another great example in Alexandria, Minnesota, where they're doing this very same thing. Great new school, um, connecting students to their passion, right? The, what is it that you want to learn about? Business and communications and healthcare. You can become a nursing assistant while you're in high school. Um, tech and in the trades and culinary arts, all of it there in this beautiful school with that in mind and partnerships created with the employers in that community. Awesome, hands-on learning. There's a gentleman that I have met named Joe Brown, who is a teacher in Fairmont, Minnesota, and he has created a trades-based opportunity on Saturdays outside of the school system, so their students get a chance to do that hands-on things like welding. Um, but because of the way that we pay for school right now, it is not properly funded. Um, and I think that's the question for us. Can we assure um, high quality, while making sure our kids are getting a really great uh, exposure to the opportunities, uh, whether they choose a two-year school, uh, whether they choose to go through the apprenticeship of the trades in Minnesota, or they choose a, a four-year university, the Minnesota, University of Minnesota, um, we want to make sure our kids are getting a great education. I couldn't agree with you more, Representative Liebling, on that idea that education is an end into itself. Uh, but also that you're getting exposed to the opportunities of the world while you're in school so you can imagine your own future. That's our job, too. And Representative Downey. Yeah, we actually may have more agreement on this question. Uh, so I remember when I was in high school, I took uh, shop, woodworking, and small gas engines in a suburban high school, right? That was just part of the program and part of the curriculum, and all of that, I shouldn't say all, but most of that has been lifted out. And so I think a return to some of those components uh, in almost every high school environment would be helpful. I also agree with Representative Liebling. Um, the Constitution does talk about education, the purpose of it being to have an educated electorate uh, that can advance and further our democracy. And so there's a basic core component that I think has been uh, emasculated as well in terms of civics and history and government and, and things that we need to have there. And so I think there's got to be a basic core and then other options. Uh, I have actually proposed uh, through my voucher program uh, a voucher program that would incentivize charter schools and the like that are maybe focused on trades, tech, ag, don't forget that component as well. So I think we have a focus that has started to emerge in Minnesota. Some great models. Uh, I wasn't aware of the Hutchinson one, but Alexandria uh, I was. And so I think uh, with the commitment that I sense occurring here um, that we can start to re-equip our K-12 systems with charter, very targeted charter systems, and our higher ed system to focus much more on those jobs of the future. Because guess what? The jobs of the future are going to require those kinds of skills. We're down to the last question, and I give, give you lots of latitude here to get it at a high level and talk about the, the role of the governor in setting a tone in, in a, a changing state with our changing demographics, our changing composition, and a state with a crying workforce shortage that's forecast to only get worse. 
What's the role of the governor to uh, help Minnesotans adjust to the changes that will be needed to get through this demographic trough that we have coming in the next 10 or 15 years? And I started with Keith Downey, I think, at the beginning, so I'll start with Representative Liebling and go this way. This okay. is your last year. I think you keep starting with me on oh, the, these, oh, well, but that's okay. okay. It's all right. no, I'm, I'm talking about, about the very beginning. Wanna... I think I started. This, okay. this, 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 that was the beginning all question right. was sort of the opening. This is the closing, all right. so I'll all start. All right, the role okay. of the, the governor. The role of the governor in helping Minnesotans adjust to the changes demographic and economic that are upon us. Right. Well, one of the reasons that I'm running is because I think too often our government gets focused on the special interests, what I call the big shots and the insiders, the people who can afford to have a lobbyist at the Capitol, the people who can afford to leave their jobs and hang around to lobby for something. And sometimes we really forget about the people who are working every day just to keep body and soul together. And right now, the economy of our state is such that about half of Minnesotans are really just struggling to get by. And so the reason that I'm running is I think we need to have a laser focus on those people and not allow, you know, it's a lot of these things will take resources. And we have a pretty wealthy state. And I think we've got to invest in our kids. We've got to invest in our young people. We've got to invest in helping people get that college education that they need. And so the role of the governor, I think, is to focus on those folks and to, you know, I mean, we obviously, you know, being a sort of a cheerleader, what they call the bully pulpit is very important to go out and advocate for some of these opportunities and, you know, try to use the agencies to make sure that we can provide these things that we've all been talking about here and do it in the best way and bring people together to get the best ideas and try to operational, operationalize those ideas. So I think the governor actually has a very important role in this, but I think that the thing that we really need to do is use our state government to the best we possibly can to level the playing field for the ordinary folks in this state who just need opportunity. And that absolutely starts with our youngest kids. Okay, Representative Murphy. What's the role of the governor in helping Minnesotans cope with these changes in demographics and, and the need for uh, more educated workers? So I decided uh, to run for governor uh, for a, a variety of reasons, but mostly because I see in front of us some real challenges. And of late, our, our politics in Minnesota is moving in the direction of a kind of Washington DC style politics that's no good for us. Uh, where we think in short-term, two-year increments and how to beat the other side instead of how to build our future. And when I think about an aging population and a workforce and the fact that uh, we have real disparities in outcomes, especially for people of color and people who are poor in the state of Minnesota, that's not good enough for me. I don't think it's good enough for Minnesotans. And as I have for the last 11 years, uh, spent my time with the people of Minnesota, I find myself committed to, devoted to our future and to the people of Minnesota, but I also find Minnesotans in that very same place. Uh, over and over again, I encounter Minnesotans who want us together to find our future. And that inspires me every day to get up. And so I think that part of this job, uh, the people's pulpit, the voice that comes with being the governor for the state of Minnesota is to remind us of our shared values, to build us and take us toward that future that we can build together, and to use the people of Minnesota and our stories and the solutions that come from us as the examples and the proof points to go forward. And I can't wait to do that as the governor for the people of Minnesota. I just saw in the back of the room my friend Jim Coppa walk in. I don't know where he is right now, but he told me a story a long, long time ago when I used to work for the Nurses Association about an elected official who visited a shelter that was caring for people who were experiencing homelessness. And there was a room that this person went into, and there were children sleeping on mattresses on the floor. And the reaction to that person, all a human reaction, was that's not right. And so that person reached into their pocket and bought cribs for that shelter to make sure that those kids weren't sleeping on the floor anymore. That is an act of charity. That's a good thing. But if we want to live in a just society, then the answer should be kids aren't living and experiencing homelessness. And bringing our voices to that shared value is part of the job of this governor. And my measure for myself and for our future is a just society. I want to do that with you. Thank you so much for having me today. Final word, Keith Downey. Thank you. Well, thanks again for having me, too. Um, so my wife and I had a lot to think about as I contemplated running for governor. And as we came to a conclusion to do it, uh, we decided that I needed to be bold. 
and to tell the people of Minnesota exactly what I think and propose the exact solutions that I would advance as governor. And so that's what I've been trying to do, and I hope you heard that from me here today. And the essence of that, the theme of my campaign, in fact, is that we need to make Minnesota work for everyone. Everyone. And we need to recover that Minnesota ethic, that tried and true ethic that built our state to where it was. But you travel the state and you find far too many places where people aren't seeing their opportunity here anymore. And if we're honest, we're living in the past a bit, folks. We're losing great companies, farms, people. We're a net out-migration state in terms of people. We are out-migration for wealth and capital. Most of the job growth is coming in government-funded sectors, not in the private sector, and you see opportunities starting to dwindle. We're trailing national measures for GDP growth, income growth, job growth in private sector areas of our economy. And so if we want to reposition Minnesota for the future, we have to make some tough decisions and reposition our state. And so I've proposed four big, bold policy agendas. One is to reinvigorate our private economy with tax relief and regulatory relief. The second is to make sure that we control and rein back in government spending and its intrusiveness. Third is the cost of health care. And fourth, something that I'm the only Republican talking about, is education and how we reposition our K-12 system to actually create the workforce for the future. So those are big things. But in terms of what a governor does, yeah, I'll fight to make all that work. And I'll take on the entrenched special interests and all the big guys that you just talked about to make it happen for the people of Minnesota. But I want to close with a story, too. I was at the state fair at my booth, and a woman came across the road at me, came right up to me and started telling me about her circumstances. And she had lost her two small businesses, her life's work. She lived in St. Paul. The taxes and the regulations were heavy to start with. Obamacare came along, and she couldn't hang on. And by the time she got done, literally, I'm not making this up, she had tears in her eyes, and she said to me, will you fight for me? Eight years I've been in politics, and no one has ever asked me, will you fight for me? And I didn't quite know what to say. And she said, because if you do, there are so many of us out here, and we will be on your side. And I thought, that is the essence of this election. The theme of my campaign to make Minnesota work for everyone is absolutely what we need to do. I'm in this race because I believe in the people of Minnesota. I trust in you, not bigger government, not bigger bureaucracies. We can get back to that tried and true Minnesota ethic, and we can flourish again as a state. I would love to be your governor to make that happen. Thank you, candidates. Thank you for your attention, audience. Have a good day. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Craig Warren, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Greater Twin Cities United Way. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here today, and I just want to share a couple of reflections on our morning. Um, and then more importantly, I want to end with a call to action, because with all this passion um, in the room, it's not enough for us just to sit here. It's a, we have to leave and, uh, and, and do something. Um, at United Way, we really believe that all kids and all kids deserve a great education that really prepares them for life. And for children and families who are experiencing poverty, we know that there are so many barriers that stand in the way of a great education. And you've gotten a deeper understanding of many of those through the many perspectives that you've heard today. And that's why we at United Way are fighting to increase access and close gaps and ensure that every child in our community uh, has an opportunity to succeed. Um, and it's really been inspiring to be here today. And I actually really do appreciate um, the passion that everyone has brought into this because we have passion because people care. And it really, that is what needed is for caring people to come together and be passionate about the different perspectives for how we come together. And um, I wanna thank Sandra for her emceeing um, the event today. So let's have a round of applause for her. I also wanna thank all, all of our speakers and particularly the students who, who moved us uh, earlier today. Another round of applause for them from Creative Arts. 
Um, and we also heard from um, what was going on in Hutchinson, and I think thank um, you all for sharing some of that, so thank you for that. Um, and finally, for the gubernatorial candidates, and for Lori for moderating that discussion, and for all of the candidates who it really was important, I think, to have different perspectives. Not everyone's saying the same thing. To bring in a sharper focus, how do we feel, what do we think about things by having um, robust perspectives um, around that. Um, so finally, with that, there's a call uh, to action. On your tables, you have one of these cards um, that's about Advocacy for Children's Day, which is on March 29th um, at the State Capitol. I hope that you will join us and all of our partners, um, which will be in the rotunda. It's going to be a dynamic, high-energy day with advocates from across the state coming to engage um, with our legislators to keep our children um, as a top priority. And really our passion and our energy and commitment is really vital to providing an education for all members, uh, all the kids in our community, um, and also for closing these education gaps. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today, for your engagement, for your work you're doing for um, and on behalf of our kids, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.